Hello. Can you hear us, Rebecca? There we go. We've got you. Hi. Hang on. Hi. I can hardly hear you. Oh, no. Oh, there we are. Okay. Jasmine. Super. Okay. Well, it is 5.02. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll start again with the intro uh, while Rebecca, you can get your screen up and get that ready to share. Um, so good evening, everyone, to, and welcome to part two of our uh, webinar this evening on chronic progressive lymphedemia, also referred to as CPL, um, presented by Rebecca Blentoff from all the way from the UK. So it's quite late where she's at over there. So thanks so much for staying up late with us to do this this evening. Uh, this fine. <laughs> yeah. This webinar was organized by the Fauna Education Committee and is being brought to you by the Fenway Foundation for, for, for Frisian Horses, who's the sponsor this evening. We are recording the webinar uh, and we will post it in our library on the Fauna Facebook page and the Fauna YouTube page. Um, so you'll be able to go back and review everything um, that we talk about this evening. Um, if you have any latency issues, just understand that that is relative to your internet connection where you're at. So if you're having an issue there, um, maybe check the speed of your internet before the next webinar to work out any issues. Um, for the audience tonight, everyone is in listen only mode. Um, we will stop periodically throughout the presentation to allow you to ask questions of Rebecca. So you can submit your questions um, by using the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So you should see a little toolbar there that allows you to submit a question. Um, I think that's it. So for right now, Rebecca, we will turn it over to you and get started. Okay, thanks again. Um, welcome everybody um, to part two. Thanks for coming back. Um, hope I didn't bore you centralist in part one. Um, so we'll just go straight into um, looking at um, how we treat equine lymphatic disease now and the differences between the human and the equine lymphatic system. So last um, time, we learned quite a lot about the structure of the lymphatic system and what happens when it goes wrong. But now it's really useful to know how this relates to our horses, what we're looking for, how we devise treatment protocols, and all of the ins and outs of, of, of how we treat this disease. Because it's, it's simple in some ways and much harder in others. But if we understand the differences between the two, we can start to make informed decisions for our horses and um and know also what stage of the disease there is and what and what options are available to us so i'll do the same as last time which is at the end of every slide i'll ask angie whether there's um any questions and then um, I'll try my best to answer them. If there are a question that I know we're going to answer later on in the in the presentation today, I'll just say, yeah, we'll we'll cover that in more depth as we go through. OK, so we're starting off now. Basically, humans are kind of funny because we have we just assume that because something suits us, that all the other animals are going to be the same. And it's not true. And because we have had so little research into um, the lymphatic system of, of animals, we, we just assume that, that things that we're doing with humans like bandaging and wound care and skin care and everything else is going to be the same for horses. There are some areas where horses respond better to treatment than humans. But there are also a lot of um, Achilles heels or things to be mindful of. So we'll start going through that in this slide. So one of the major differences between humans and equines is when you're looking at the um, human lymph vessels, the, the, the deep collector vessels, the ones that are long pipes about the size of a couple of hairs on your head, these are the ones with the angians that open and pump so you know which way they're going. Well, these in humans are made of smooth muscle fibers. So the same stuff as our heart is made of. It's got a lot of rigidity to it. Um, so when we're sitting down, this thing has, has a bit of pumping action and, it, and it's sort of quite tough. 
in horses this isn't the case we these are much more elastic fibers these are much more stretchy and bendable and this is why it's so important that the fetlock it ha has free movement in a horse because um, it's when that fetlock pumps and the fascial band stretches underneath the digital cushion up the leg that you're going to get a little bit of pressure on there helping them move now personally we don't quite know why they're elastic um we think probably because um they 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 just need to well we're really not that sure we can only kind of gather that um they have to be able to be on their on their legs a lot more and move a lot more and they're generally not lying down to sleep um but we we can only really guess at it the other difference between humans and horses is that when we're sitting on our sofas and we're resting, our lymphatic transport capacity is still working really, really well. Everything is pumping and moving and the lymph obligatory load, which is the load of the, the, the amount of lymph that the, the system has to take at any one time is, is being is being managed so if that's you know one liter it means that you know the body is 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 circulating that one liter and it's it's coping really really well in horses completely different as soon as they're standing still their transport capacity becomes suboptimum it lowers it lowers beyond what it should do and this is why kind of every stabled horse has a degree of lymphatic insufficiency, mainly because taking the same example of the lymph obligatory load being, let's say, one litre, it isn't, but you know, let's pretend it's one litre because it's nice, easy figures. Um, it means that the system's not quite able to keep that lymph obligatory load moving through the system. And that's quite profound. Uh, because that's what happens in kind of latent stage lymphedema where you don't see anything on the outside of the legs but on the inside the system is struggling somewhat. Mm, the other difference between um, humans and horses is that humans tend to have about 550 nodes between about 400 and 600. A third of them will be between the neck and the shoulders and our lymph nodes are fairly large, you know. And bear in mind, when we looked at this um, the other time, we have a lymph node and we've got one um, afferent vessel coming in, don't we? And then we've got lots of um, efferent vessels coming out because the lymph is slowed down and concentrated in a node. Now, horses have the greatest number of lymph nodes in any known mammal <laughs> in the world. We don't know of any other animal that's got more. And they've got 8,000. <laughs> and of course, they're a little bit smaller. They're like 2 to 15 mil. But if you suddenly think, OK, if I put a lot of pressure onto a system which only has 550 lymph nodes, that can cope you know, with a bit of an increase in transport capacity because you can get lymph into them. Whereas if you've got 8,000 and they are all slowing down, this is why horses have the propensity to bottleneck. And this is why when we get um, a skin infection that affects the lymphatics, or we call it cellulitis in human medicine, it turns into lymphangitis in horses because the lymph is in, it, it, it'd be fighting an infection, the lymphatic system is not working properly, and everything is bottlenecking and slowing through these nodes and that's what causes these massive legs to swell in lymphangitis infections that's the only reason they've just got far more lymph nodes the other thing is that when we sit down we have our muscles on our lower legs and in our arms and when we're sitting there even if we're just stretching or moving you know we have a bit of muscular contraction there and so the lymph in our legs doesn't rely on that much of that, our ankle moving at all. It mainly works on um, muscular contraction and arterial pulsation um, to get the lymph back up our legs. Whereas horses pretty much, they've got no musculature below the knee and the hock. They haven't got any muscular to help pump that lymph. And so everything is very, very dependent and driven on this pump mechanism from the fetlock joint. Okay, so hence when they are in a stable, 
they're suboptimum, they're not moving, they're not pumping. This is all really bad for the horse. Um, the other difference that um, well, can act as a positive and a negative for horses is that in humans, um, we have no ability to reach the deep collective vessels. So do you remember the other session I was talking about the superficial being the skin and the deep draining all the organs and viscera and everything underneath the skin? Um, we can't access that when we administer manual lymph drainage to a human. There's no place that we can do it because we're covered in muscle or bone. Whereas in a horse, we can. Now we can affect that below the knee in the hog. We can affect that positively because manual lymph drainage and compression will affect both the superficial and the deep. So they respond very, very, very quickly. But on the negative side, because they've got no musculature, it's very, very easy to overcompress. And when you overcompress, you can cut off the lymph drainage of the leg. So if you're doing everything correctly, you get amazing results. If you do anything badly, you can really damage things. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense with the, um, the two systems of quite, quite profound differences that nobody's really aware of. But when you're aware of them, they, they actually become quite frightening. Um, any questions from that one? Yeah, we have one question and it is, are horses with CPL that develop cellulitis more prone to progressing into lymphangitis? Yeah, they can, they can do um, because um, yeah, as the disease, as CPL progresses, you've got more waste material in the leg, which bacteria love to get into. You've got more tissue changes, so it's harder to drain the area. And as the disease progresses, the leg becomes harder and the harder it is, the, the harder it is to move waste out of the leg. So um, yeah, the, one of the main issues with um, CPL horses is A, when you're clipping them or shaving them as you call in America, um, you must follow, um, follow Hannah Johnson's clipping protocol on her CPL page because you, know, you need to really take care of that skin in the first week to 10 days of clipping a leg, which we have to do because we have to look at what's going on. Um, but then you're losing the protective oils and, and such like. But um, if in, in the deeper skin folds where you get wound um, maceration and um, moisture associated skin damage through um, into trigo and things, well, these are areas that usually stay quite localized. But if the infection is allowed to you know, take hold and people aren't being very vigilant, this can easily turn into cellulitis and lymphangitis. And how we define cellulitis and lymphangitis in, in England in, in veterinary medicine is cellulitis is usually localized to a joint or a part of the leg. Um, so like a massive swollen fetlock joint, you know, where the infection is sort of staying in there. Um, whereas lymphangitis is where the whole leg blows. And, and that th these can be quite quite frightening and they can blow very, very quickly, um, literally half an hour and your leg can be double in size. Um, so with suspect infection, you have to be really on the case with these things, um, especially if your horse is very progressed with um, in CPL, in the, in the C in, you know, let's say they're, they're getting big, big and very hard skin folds, then they're gonna be more, more susceptible, definitely. Uh, the other question is about, um, you mentioned massage. And so this question relates to those handy hand massages that we're seeing people use with horses all the time now. I don't know if that's a thing in the UK, but there's been quite a lot of that circulating on social media lately where you can buy these handheld massagers, which are supposed to be great for your horse. Is that something that you would Mm. want to do as an untrained person <laughs> <laughs> you have to be very 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 careful you have to be very very careful and if you're not sure please do go and ask the question on the on, on hannah's cpl uh, facebook page because she is and we are as the group experts are very very sharp on this because it's so easy for a company to say yeah this helps circulation which was all very nebulous concepts. 
but actually um, anything that going back to the washing up bowl analogy, you know, you've got your arterial blood coming in, you've got your venous return coming out, and then you've got your lymphatics in the middle taking things out. So of course they think, oh, you know, the lymphatics is taking things out. So yeah, yeah, it's all just moving circulation. Isn't that great? No, <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> because if you're increased, if you massage skin, it goes pink. You've basically, you've basically told the, you know, you've brought arterial blood into that washing up bowl, into the interstitial fluid. Now, what you've done is you're asking the veins to take away quite a lot more because you've filled it up. And you also ask the lymphatics to take away more. And the lymphatics are already under strain. So you're straining them more than they should do. So you have to be quite careful with things that um, promote heat, promote um, circulation. Quite often these are, are actually just working on increasing blood flow. And in manual lymph drainage, we always work never to increase blood flow because you're increasing blood flow in, you got to get it back out. And that is the key. You have to be quite careful. Hence, when you have a horse and will go on to the end where you're, you're, you know, bringing them out of the stable suboptimum, you need to give them a long warm up <laughs> to get them going and a long cool down so that you're not, you know, you're allowing that system to come up and allow them to cool down and you're not overstimulating um, beyond the capacity of what the body can cope with naturally. So hopefully that's answered that one. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. But please do always ask the question on the page because we are linked in with physicists, chemists, um, people that really understand these machines and gadgets. Now, that's nothing about going and massaging a shoulder or somewhere else. But on that page, there will be a skin territory page, which will show you that the back legs um, have a superficial skin territory to half of the stomach. Um, to where you do the half moon clip um, on a blanket clip and sort of half of the hindquarters. So you don't want to be stimulating that whole superficial territory if, if the legs, you know, the hind legs fall in that territory. But you can obviously work the back and other areas that might be sore because, you know, we, we, we have these are athletes, we have to look after them. But you just have to be a bit mindful. And if it is necessary to do a little bit of massaging, let's say, um you know i don't know just above the hock then yes do it if, it if there's a muscular problem there but then make sure you walk your horse a lot so that you know it's got time to cope with that and also you wouldn't be doing it every day anyway you know so you just have to be right. a bit careful we've got a similar question about the theraplate and I, i'm sure you've heard of that it's a vibration plate that you would stand your horse on so quite a bit yeah. of vibration going up to the leg is that something that would be Productive yeah, or we, counterproductive? We, we, would, yeah, we wouldn't advise that either. Um, we have to be very, very careful with vibration in uh, lymphatics because the little tiny initial lymphatics, the ones that are on those little tiny anchoring filaments and open and close, we have to be very careful about vibrating machines. So even TENS machines um, can affect the opening and closing ability of those initial lymphatic vessels in the superficial system. Uh, okay, there's not enough research on it, but we, you know, we, 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 we're very mindful of that. We, we don't want to stop these things opening and closing because otherwise you've, you've basically stuffed your superficial drainage or potentially could have. So we tend to err on the side of caution here. Got it. I think that's all the questions. Right, okay, let's go <laughs> on to the next one. Okay, so when we've got a horse coming in, um, what the hell do we do? Well, the last time we looked at them, we, we start to um, take volume, well, we first of all, we ascertain where they are in the stage of the disease. We measure the leg. Um, and in Germany, you know, they, and, and in human lymphedema, you're literally drawing up a leg every, you know, few centimeters and you're taking massive volume measurements. And this is OK as so long as you've got a very compliant human sitting in a clinic, you know, they're not moving and they're not covered in mud and they don't want to kick you either. <laughs> so, you know, it's much, much harder with a horse now we don't need you know volume measurements to the nth degree it's a waste of time in a way and, and you know we've all got far better things to do so we tend to do the what i call the holy trinity so we will do 
the volume measurements by taking um, from this form, for example, will be taking height measurements and circumferences. So the, let's say that the mid fetlock is, I don't know, seven centimeters up. Then you know, as an owner, you can always measure seven centimeters up the leg and you can check that circumference so that over the year you can see whether it's going up or down, whether it's maintaining okay. And that's actually really an important part of your maintenance protocol on a horse. Um, and the other thing, of course, we do is the press test and the stretch test for the tissue quality. And then we need to know, well, do you, you, do you, would you like me to go through the press and stretch test again with you guys or that would be helpful? I, don't there, I think maybe quickly there may be some. Yeah, okay. So, on the, the last one. so the press and test, press and stretch, I'm going to show you on my arm and we're going to pretend that my arm is a cannon bone. So the first thing you need to do, on, and it will feel very much like your, like your arm actually, is if you imagine that my hand is the knee or the hock, you want to just wrap your hand very gently, just like that, just underneath the knee and the hock. And you want to just pull the skin, you'll feel it sliding up and down like that really gently. And then when you look down on the leg by the um, by the pastons, you'll see that the, the, the fur on the pastons will be moving and you'll get this lovely gliding sensation. And when you let go, you'll feel that the skin will bop back, you know, some elasticity to it. When you get a friend or a colleague to squeeze your arm like this, and then try to move your skin up and down, you will feel the difference. And if you do that on all four of your horse's legs, you will feel the difference between the two. And what the stretch test tells you is how much damage has been in there from infection, how far up it's gone, um, and how much collagen pro um, proliferation and elastin degradation has been happening in the leg. So that's quite a useful one. The other one you can do is the press test. Now, this is quite subtle on a horse because we've got no muscle. But if you take the cannon bone and you're not looking at the front of the cannon bone and you're not exactly on the side where the tendons come, you're sort of in between in that quarter between the front of the cannon bone and the side. You're kind of like about there. And starting at um, just on the fetlock joint, you want to hold your finger flat. You're not poking like this. You're holding your finger nice and flat um, next to the skin. And then you're pressing, but you're sinking in and you're pressing quite firmly, like, you know, firm, not wimply. And what, what you'll feel then is you hold for five seconds, take your finger away, and then just lightly run your finger over where you were holding. And it's very subtle in a horse because, of course, you know, I do it on my arm. We've got a whole load of, you know, muscle here, but um, it, it's, it's very, it's almost like if you imagine two sheets of um, brown paper with a tiny smear of thick honey in between. And when you press onto it, you will feel a little dent mark. OK, now, as soon as you feel that dent mark, that is lymphedema that is the waste material left behind and that's why we do that all the way up the leg so we can see how far that leg is filling so let's say it's it's pitting to here it means that we would always apply a bandage to just or compression to just over that point to make sure that we're covering all the areas that's been affected so those are great because you can, um, let's say your horse is maintaining really well in compression, but let's say in six months time, you take the compression off, you measure it, and the measurements are the same. But let's say you do the press and stretch test and the press and stretch test shows that the tissue quality has got better. Well, in that case, that's great. We've, we, this is working, this is fantastic. You know, we're rolling back the, the disease progression here. Um, but and also one thing you can do in that point is you might have rolled it back so much you can actually lower your compression class so you could actually use a bit less pressure um, because you might you know still be getting good results but conversely on the other side let's say you take your compression off and you notice that your press and stretch feels like the tissue's got a little bit harder in that case, it might be indicative that there might be something else going on, um, that there might be arthritis further up the leg and that's impeding lymph flow, or it might be an indication that you need to go up 
a little bit with your compression and, and put a little bit more pressure on there. Um, so those three, the holy trinity of measurements, press and stretch, really, really are the cornerstone of making sure that you, you're managing that treatment as the horse progresses through his life. And then you can adapt accordingly. And it's relatively simple when you know how <laughs> we, we, we do now. <laughs> um, the other thing we do is we check feather, we check how often um, things are clipped because of course, the thickness, the thickness of the feather acts as a kind of like a damper. So if you have extremely thick um, feather, you need a little bit more pressure because you've got to get through that hair to get pressure to the skin. And we also check the CPL score um, which runs from AA or A, B, C, and D, um, depending on the skin folds and the degree of um, nodules, wounds, um, you know, what's going on in the leg. Um, and as I was saying before, that, you know, it's such a shame that the vets ran off and did this <laughs> because um, they didn't make sure that their system um joined beautifully with the human system but it doesn't matter because we we know what what they mean really and we have charts that will show what the vets mean and how the two systems can join together so one of the things when i got involved with this i looked at it and thought well hang on a minute you know you've got cpl b but you know how does that fit with how we categorize human lymphedema it should be the same but sadly it isn't but we, we just work around that <laughs> we just have to <laughs> So um, any questions with this one at all? Yeah, I have one question and it is, how difficult is it to do this accurately if your hair, if, you, if excuse me, your horse has a lot of hair on its legs and you haven't shaved? Right, um, it's, it's quite difficult. Yeah, you have to, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you can, if you, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. Some horses are really, really stressed about their legs that need a lot of time to desensitize, to be able to shave or clip their legs. It's hard to get your fingers in. Sometimes it's a big shock. If, if, you, if you've got that really, really thick, I mean, shire horse feather is notoriously awful. You can't even get your fingers through. And, and yeah, I would advocate trying to thin it out and, and get a look in there, even if you only do it once. I mean, I just saw a beautiful um, Clydesdale actually the other day on the Wirral, uh, she's a very beautiful um, mare, um, very wispy feather, but we took it off and the, the owner took it off anyway. And it was quite useful because those, those skin folds were pretty hard, um, harder than we, we, I thought that we we're probably going to be. Um, but it's always a good thing to have it. And then at least you can take the photos and you can get the, the idea of them, you can measure them. Um, and so then if you decide to grow the feather back, you can then find ways around it. So we can use little kind of lollipop sticks or whatever and push them in gently and with a vinyl glove over them, you know, for, you have to be careful here, push them between the skin folds and then take the lollipop stick out and, and say, okay, well, the gap is, you know, five centimeters, it hasn't got any worse. Um, but yeah, so you have to find your ways if you've got feather. Um, and you know, yeah, we tend to advise take it off if you could, because just to give a, a good indication of what it is and photograph it um, and and measure. And don't be frightened to get your marker pens out and you know draw things round or take pictures with a a measure uh, a ruler next to them. Um, because if you're gonna do it, you might as well document everything. Um, so that if you need to take the feather off again in a couple of years time, you know what you've, you know what's happened. Yeah. That's the only question I have right now. Okay, right. So, um, as I was saying, the, the, the system between the two of classification is really annoying. Um, and I mean, we won't go into this in great depth. That's up on the Equilymph website for anyone that wants to have a greater look at it. But they, they've basically just missed out the whole latent stage um, in looking at humans and, and horses. So when you see on the left, you can see the stages of, of lymphedema. Um, stage zero, we would call preclinical, but at risk, which is zero. And then when you get to stage one, it's the stable fill stocked legs thing where you get a little bit of swelling in the stable overnight and then they walk and it comes down, but they don't even really look at that stage either. It's only when it starts staying and hanging around 
that they start to CPL score it in horses. And, you know, okay, fine. We, we you know, you, you could argue, okay, there's nothing to look at before that point. But I would say, uh-uh, we need to know that those latent stages and, and spontaneously reversible stages exist because we need to take stable fill seriously. And we have to also realize that, you know, subclinical doesn't mean that nothing's going on things are changing in there and we need to be aware of that and we need to get hold of the earlier if we catch things at the end of latent stage at the beginning of stable fill the chances that your, your horse will progress is really low and if you catch it at that point the horse will have much better treatment um um treatment what it would be it will be much more um likely that that horse will be able to carry on the rest of its working days absolutely happy without any deterioration whereas as soon as you're looking at it when you start to see the tissue state changes on the outside of the leg well you've already you've already gone through quite a, a substantial amount of deterioration so we mustn't forget that when we look at cpl scores you know it's easy to say oh a cpl score of, of a is kind of okay but it kind of isn't it means it could have been around for quite a while and um you know we, we i can see horses at, at cpl stage a which you know are, are quite hard quite you can feel the tissue is quite indurated um which means that the that that latent stage has been going on quite a long time um so always remember that with the cpl scores when you look at them always always remember that by the time you see something it may have been progressing for a very very long time um and and i feel i feel that the veterinary way of categorizing this has has not really taken that into full effect really because we need to be looking at this disease in a much earlier time yeah questions on that one no questions right now okay oh. so once we've analyzed what is going on with the horse and we know what stage they are and we've done their measurements we've looked at their feather we've looked at their legs we've monitored the hell out of everything we know how they're kept we've, we've sort of talked to the owner we know what's going on we split the treatment into two and the way that we do that is we classify one as the active stage and then the um, second bit is what we call the maintenance stage so the active stage is you know we assess we monitor we do lymph drainage if it's needed we look at the skin care and the wound care we apply compression bandaging because we want to get any fluid out of there we can and then we once the fluid volume is down to the lowest we can that's the end of the active stage now <laughs> what we really have is an active stage for cpl and an active stage for the secondary lymphedemas, the ones that have um, had lymphangitis infections. And it's different because the CPL horses have very, very little fluid volume. It's hardly worth ever bandaging them using compression bandages because they don't have massive volumes. But what they do have is um, massive tissue changes. So we tend not to use the active stage too much on CPL horses. We do hugely use the active stage when it comes to the secondary lymphedemas, the ones with the big hind leg that's had repeated lymphangitis or cellulitis infections, because these are categorized by massive fluid volumes. And the only way to get those down is with multi-layer lymphedema bandaging, a massive active plan, active stage. But if you took a human leg, up at 50% volume and a horse leg at 50% volume, the human would probably reduce that leg within 10 sessions, maybe eight to 10 sessions of three days each. So you're looking at a month to two months, whereas a horse you'd lose that three to six days, which is fantastic. You know, they because you're activating the deep and the, and the superficial in the leg, they respond so fast. It is glorious. It's glorious. It's, it's, I never tire of it. I've done it many years and I never, I never get tired of it. It's like Christmas. Um, once we finish with the fluid volumes, we move out into maintenance stage. 
And maintenance stage is basically all about using the right compression garment for the right amount of time to stop that leg from refilling or to stop it from degrading, okay? And again, we split it into two. So the CPL horses, they tend to need maintenance a lot more because, um, because it takes a long of a while. It's a slower process to pull back those tissue changes, okay? With the, um, with the secondary lymphedemas, the maintenance, again, is, is probably about the same, you know, they, um, except they can run into a bit of trouble. They might often need um, compression, light compression when they're turned out, and they'll need firmer compression when they're in the stable but mostly all CPL horses will just need compression if they're stabled at night or if they are kept in a small pen where they can't walk around that much. So knowing those two, you know, you have to treat them slightly differently. Okay, okay so yes, yeah, so actually this is my, I guess my clarification. When you were earlier talking about we don't use compression bandages on active stage, that's, just for the audience, we're talking about two different things when we talk about compression garments and, and compression bandaging for like lymphangitis or something like that. Total, yeah. Different, different mechanisms there. We will, I'll show you it later in the, in the gotcha. talk and you'll see that. Um, but it's useful to know that when I see a CPL horse, I'm generally not thinking about getting fluid volumes down because they don't have them. I go, I go straight to maintenance really with them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the secondary lymphedemas that have had repeated infections of cellulitis and lymphangitis, the active stage is huge. You have to do a hell of a lot for those horses um, because the fluid, uh, the, the bigger the fluid volume, the more likely they are to have an infection. And we know it's exponential, it's like a bell curve. So like in a human hand um, or arm, if you've got under 10% fluid volume um, that's as compared to the non-pathological limb, your propensity for getting infection is quite low. It's only about 15% in the year. If the arm goes up to 30%, you, your chance of infection goes up to 50. And if your arm is 50, your chance of infection that year goes up to about 90%. So it's very indicative, you know, the bigger the leg, the more chance of infection, but this is fluid volumes, bear in mind. So, and also, bear, you know, in CPL to a degree, we don't have the fluid volumes, but we do have, you know, huge tissue changes, and then you will get those infections in between the skin folds. So yeah, it's slightly different, but we'll, we'll, I'll show you each, each one so that you can see what, what we do for each one. Okay. Okay, so this is just a graph of how we um, how we run from active to maintenance. Um, so if you look at the um, left hand side, you can see this is exactly what I'd be showing um, showing owners that I'd be doing if I was doing multi layer lymphedema bandaging to reduce volume. Um, we would put the bandage on in day one. That far left column, we'd leave that on for three days you then get the most dramatic reduction within the three days. We would then take off the bandaging, check the leg, re-measure, and then we would reapply the bandage again for three days. That would then, you can see the arrows, you know, the first one's quite steep, the second one's not so steep, and the third one's not so steep. It tends to just lessen slightly. That's normal, that's what happens. And then you reach the middle where, you know, you're coming down to fluid volumes of like under 5%. That's where you want to be if you can. And then at that point, you start to say, OK, let's see whether we can get this horse into maintenance now. And usually what I do is I say, let's take the bandages off in the morning. We'll measure the leg. We'll turn the horse out in the field for the day, we'll bring it in. And then when we bring it in, we measure the leg again. And if the measurements are the same, we know that that horse is able to cope and can keep things in balance just by walking around and flexing the fetlock joint. 90% of them fall into that. <laughs> uh, and then we just compress them when they're in the stable and it's fairly simple. And then the 10% the of the very unlucky ones have to wear 
light compression in the field and slightly heavier compression in the stable. And that's usually just because they've had so many infections that the lymphatic vessels are just so damaged. They just can't, they just can't keep in balance and they, they just need that little bit of extra. But you'll generally find that you'll need less pressure if the horse is walking around in the field and more if, they are, if, if they're that way um, inclined. But as I say, it's 10% of my client load. So it's not a huge amount, but, you know, occasionally, you just have to have to do that. The nice thing about CPL is they very, very rarely would need um, compression in the field um, at all. As, as they're moving, I tend to say, do you know what? If the measurements are staying the same, don't put anything on the leg. Just keep them moving if you can. Because as much as we need compression, we always got to remember that these are horses <laughs> and they have big accidents waiting to happen. If we can do without the compression, then that's a good thing <laughs> because, you know, there's always risk of, you know, something running up underneath the compression and rubbing or, you know, a Shetland pony coming to pull it off halfway and it all twisting up. You know, I mean, you know, we, we're all horse owners. We know what they're like, you know. Um, so we try and we try not to to put them in it if we, if we can help it. Yeah, I think that, I think that's uh, that's very helpful to understand that if it's a CPL horse, it's not an active lymphangitis case. That that most of them do well when they're just turned out. If you if you have a horse where you've had to bandage and you take that bandage off and you turn the horse out and you're waiting to see how long it um, or you're you're waiting to see what the lymphatics are going to do if they're going to clear that fluid and it's going to stay the same as the last time you measured it when you took the bandage off about how many hours does it take for the body to kind of go through that pro is it different for every horse or yeah yeah that's a great question Angie and I really love that question because I was going to actually just say that so you've preempted me every single horse will have a different re refill rate and um, most CPL horses will have a very slow one you know it'll usually happen over a week to 10 days that you'll see that filling slightly the secondary lymphedemas the ones that have had the lymphangitis infection oof, they can sometimes fill in five hours and they can start to refill they can usually the most common um presentation is they'll fill in two to three days and more quickly if it's very hot weather because oh. hot weather means the body is trying to cool down so it sends more arterial blood into the tissue spaces to cool and then that has that has a knock-on effect to um loading the veins and the lymphatics have to work harder it's exactly the same oh. as us when we're standing in a queue in the heat and we're standing up or sitting still in the heat we will tend to get sw slightly swollen lower legs it's kind of normal but that is mainly because our body's trying to keep us cool the blood's going in it's struggling to cut the lymphatics are struggling to pick it back out and we're not moving so you know that that does happen yeah and you so, were talking about that long longer period of time for cpl horses is that yeah. where we go back to um picturing that hourglass that you talked about so i've left my horse in the stable overnight now i've got to leave it outside for eight hours too to equal that out and if i if i've left the horse stabled for two days now i have I, i'm behind the curve and it's hard to yeah. make that time up yeah think about it as in like yeah exactly that hourglass is such a good analogy and it means that you can give yourself a break if you know if you think oh crikey you know i've i've broken my leg and my husband's you know run off with somebody or whatever there's been nobody to look after the horse has been in a small pen for a week and you look at the leg and you think oh crikey it's gone up well, then, you know, you know your baseline measurements. You can then say, OK, let's just turn the horse out for a week and see what happens. You've got your measurements. If that if those measurements go back, then you're OK. Um, if they haven't quite gone back, you might need to say, OK, look, I'm just going to put the compression on for a little bit. In fact, I advised a lady the other day and it was quite good. She was very, very tuned into her horse and they had had lymphangitis about four times. And she worked out just by looking at the horse and measuring that her horse's refill rate was four and a half hours. Wow, that's amazing. Because <laughs> she just knew it so well. And um, so you can, you can get very tuned into them. But with CPL, pure CPL, it's a much slower process. You're not going to see those refills coming in quick because they never had much fluid in there in the first place. 
So, um, you know, you would, you know, you just, you'd probably see that coming in over a week to 10 days if it was going to come in. Um, and as I say, faster if it's very hot weather. Gotcha. Right. Interesting. Okay. So this is multilayer lymphedema bandaging. And this is what we would do for the active stage, um, mainly for horses that have um, had lymphangitis and have the huge um, legs. And what it is um, on the right, you can see this is a, a compression bandage that's put on. This is what they do at the, uni at, uh, the University of Hanover. This is how I trained. Um, these are, um, are um, cotton wool roll, uh, 15 centimeters rolls of cotton wool uh, made into a cylindrical shape. And then they use a, a fabric knitted bandage called a Rosadal K. Um, and these are really not, I, I, you have to do many, many, many hours before you're even halfway proficient with this bandaging. Firstly, the um, cotton wool falls apart. It gets absolutely filthy. You can't reuse it, <laughs> complete nightmare. If it gets wet, it just turns into a sodden mess. It kind of works for Germany in a way because they've got, you know, they're going from an inside stable barn into an indoor arena and they're not really doing much else. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's a night nightmare. Now, the thing about this bandage is you can't cut it and you can over compress it. So it is not safe for regular human use, unless you want to go and do 200 hours of this, you know, it's really not suitable. And the reason why is you can start bandaging a leg and your bandage finishes here. Then you go with the next bandage. Then you have to go and do another bandage, but it might finish slightly higher than the first one. So you've got to remember that you've got double pressure here. Then your first bandage goes on too long because you can't cut it. So you have to go back down and then you have to realize you've got three bits of pressure here. When you start from the bottom again, <laughs> it just becomes, it becomes an absolute nightmare. And, and, and also, you know, if you just accidentally pull it a little bit too hard, it's exactly like what happens when you're wearing a new pair of shoes and you go out walking and suddenly, ow, within from one second to another it hurts and is exactly with the horses and it is frightening because it hurts and it hurts quickly and the horses will literally almost fall over because they are distressed so when i came back to the uk looking at this i thought do you know what there's no way i can do this it's just too dangerous for my mind it's okay in a in a clinic setting where, where they have you know three horses with this disease and each horse is looked after by two veterinary nurses you know they've got enough staff to cope with this um through the night and they've got people living there on site and cameras we don't have that you know like we're never gonna have that if we do it's we're lucky but it isn't gonna happen and so i use a completely different system because uh, I, if an owner needs to learn this, which they do need to know, it needs to be safe. And so I use um, kind of like what we call soft band, which is an undercast padding, which is reusable and it's, it wicks. So, you know, if it gets wet, it can dry out. And I use a safe lock system so that you can't over compress. And also you can cut the bandage so that you can get the beautiful layers without having to worry. And that works brilliantly and we love it. So um, it's great, really, really great. And I work on the principle that if you're an owner and you have a horse with this disease, um, you, you know, the chances of it getting another bout of lymphangitis is high. The owner is the primary carer for that horse for life or for the time the owner has it. So the owner needs to know how to do that for their horse. It's a given, you know, we, we're a small country, but it still takes me a long time to drive, uh, you know, six hours to North or whatever. And, you know, it just becomes completely non cost effective. And, and, you know, literally, I don't want to be sat in a car all day, to be fair. And time, like time is important in these acute cases, right? Yeah, six hours yeah. is important. Yeah, except we wouldn't bandage until um, seven to 10 days clear of the last dose of antibiotics, because we have to make sure that that infection is gone and has been completely eradicated. So I, 
I, I have had a case where the vet said like bandage this straight on the day two after finishing the course of antibiotics, but they didn't give a strong enough or a long enough dose. And that thing, and sometimes that can happen, it can brew up um, slowly. And, and now I just say absolutely no way. Last course of, last dose of antibiotics, then I want seven to 10 days clear after that, because and where you do nothing apart from walk, keep the horse moving as much as you can. Because then I want to know that that, that period of time is safe. After the seven to 10 days, we start with our bandaging. And then we know that it's that there's no in, there's no small pocket of infection left, and if we've had big problems, and the three big 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 problems with lymphangitis infection is a where the infection is so terrible that the skin bursts open, secondly where the coronary band is going to split and you're going to lose your hoof, or the third case where you've got lymphorrhea, which is clear fluid, which is lymph back flowing out of the leg. Um, those three cases, if the horse is able, I try to get it into an equine unit. Um, those have got to be done under veterinary supervision and I adapt the bandage. And what I do then is usually stay up with the horse all night um, and um, I draw the circumferences on in pen. And then underneath the circumference, I'll write, you know, this is 23 centimeters and I will instruct the veterinary nurses to throw that tape measure around that leg every half an hour wow. and if that and I only put one layer of bandage on um, and if, if that it looks like it's gone up half a centimeter I take the bandaging off because if if the antibiotic dose isn't strong enough and the leg blows you're blowing a leg in a bandage right. which cause such constriction that you can end up with gangrene you know where you will lose your horse but we're in a gray area with those severe cases because without looking after them we're going to lose them anyway so we have to make those decisions and fortunately touch wood we we've always got them through it um but it's a it's a it's a thing i really don't like doing <laughs> At all. <laughs> it sounds very scary, but I guess my takeaway from that discussion is, you know, if you start to see that really unusual swelling going up the leg or the horse has a fever with swollen leg, you know, you need to get the vet involved. Yeah. And, and also, you know, let's say if it's had one bout of lymphangitis and the vet's given it, you know, a, a quick dose of, of IV antibiotics followed by a seven day course of, of oral antibiotics. If that horse gets that lymphangitis a second time, you need to advocate for your horse because the second infection is going to be well bedded in and they're going to need two to three days of IV and maybe, you know, 10 days to two weeks of oral antibiotics because the vet need to hit that harder the second time and even harder the third time because and, and this is what they're failing to do right now is because they don't want to over prescribe antibiotics. But to be honest, with this infection, if you don't hit it hard and fast, you you're on a losing wicket with them. You have to you have to hit it hard. And I advise all my clients that if they're in a place that can be snowed in or, you know, at risk of, you know, a vet not being able to get to you on a on a public holiday, um, you know, you need a course of oral antibiotics on the yard because, you know, if you're snowed in, you've got to give them something. And most vets, if you badger them a bit, will do what you do. Do what they do what you ask and if they don't find somebody else you have to be their advocate here because we have a lot of problem with this in in the uk and i'm sure you probably do in america as well oof oof just <laughs> makes me nervous to think about it <laughs> <laughs> right okay so one question that a lot of people ask is why the hell do we make their legs a cylinder for god's sake this is ridiculous and the reason why is because we have Laplace's law of fluid dynamics. Now, you don't need to know this at all. But basically, let's pretend that my glasses case here is a cylinder with fluid in it. OK, and we've got the hoof here and we've got the top of the leg here and we want to move the fluid from the bottom to the top. Now, we need more pressure at the bottom and less and less and less and less as we go up. 
because if we put a band of pressure here, it means that the lymph is going to come up and hit that band of pressure and it's not wanting to go through, okay? So Laplace's law is how we manage this multi-layer lymphedema bandage. And this bandage is great because it just perfectly works on this. Now, it works on this principle. If you have a bandage that's quite narrow, like let's say the width of my fingers, it, and you wrap it around a cylinder, it'll give more pressure. If you have a bandage that's three fingers width, it'll give slightly less pressure. And if you have a bandage that's four centimeters width, it will give even less pressure. Ta-da! Simple. We put the bandage on, the smallest bandage first, then the medium bandage, then the higher bandage, and we know we have graduated pressure. That's Laplace's law. Great, but always very useful if you're doing anything in wound care or anything. It's always to make sure that you know if you're bandaging here, you need more pressure there and less as you go along. So always, as a general rule of thumb in humans, for example, your heart is like you know the the place the the bit is kind of returning to this area. So the further away, more pressure, and the more towards middle, you need less. But and that's how you actually heal wounds much faster as well, which is kind of cool. So it's always a good thing to know. And if the vets or the doctors give you a hard time, just sort of to say, oh, come on, surely you know about Laplace's law of fluid dynamics and look at them and then they'll they'll freak out and say, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and think, oh, I'm not going to hassle you anymore. <laughs> you get away with it. Then. <laughs> but that's how, that's how we do it. here. We just basically bamboozle them with um, physics and fluid fluid dynamics. But, you know, um, you just you don't need to know how it works. You just need to know it works. Um, any questions on that? No questions right now. OK, right. So again, um, I, this is just another infographic which shows, you know, that with any compression, so we've, let's say we've done the multi-layer lymphedema bandage now, we've reduced the leg. Now we're into the kind of maintenance stage. So whatever, when I use the word compression garment, I really mean anything that is lightweight that we put on a leg that stops it from refilling, okay, or supports the leg so that the, the CPL horses, for example, they're always suboptimum. The sand timer is going the wrong way when they're stabled. But if we compress them with compression garments, we can halt that progression. The sand goes back up the timer. We're clawing back. We're stopping the degradation going on. So always, always with anything that we put on our horse's legs, we must always remember that the greater pressure must always go distally to the hoof end and everything goes up. Now, people will always ask me, you know, what's the best thing to put on the leg? I mean, what, what like I need brushing boots, I, I can beat my horse, you know, what can I put on? Well, basic rule of thumb is I don't care what you put on to protect your horse's leg because it's important to protect them because you don't want to have a, um, you know, a cut or a wound because they're very difficult to heal and you can get infection. So I always say that, you know, check that it fits properly first, make sure that it's not going to rub and cause any, any rub wounds. That's the most important thing. Then whatever straps you have, if you pull them and you make sure that they're not too elastic, um, if they are a little bit too elastic, try and sew along the line to stop it from, you know, being too elasticy. And then when you put that on the leg, make sure that you do it up a little bit. And I mean, this is subtle, subtle pressure, just a little bit firmer at the bottom and just slightly looser as you go up the leg. Um, and that's a really just an important thing. And that goes with, you know, protective boots, competition boots, bandaging for wound care products and, you know, proper lymphedema compression garments. We should be doing it anyway, really. Um, so that, that's the general rule of thumb about graduated pressure. Um, and the next thing is, well, yeah, is, is, is non-elasticity. Um, elasticity in horses, absolute nightmare. Um, because of this problem of no musculature below the knee and the hock. Now, how you tell if something is too elastic is um, get your bandage or whatever you want to use, measure out one meter and then pull it. And if it's stretching more than 10%, so one meter 10, you don't want to be any more elastic than that. So obviously smaller straps, you're going to have to 
you know, use your ratios and figure out what you're doing. You know, if it's 10 centimeters, you know, you don't want it to go, you know, much over uh, 10% on that. And like you say, like I say, you know, if that's your, if that's your strap, you can always, and it's pulling that way and it's a little bit too elastic, you can always get your sewing machine and you can sew some lines down because then when you pull it, it's, it's not going to let it elastic so much. And this coming up now will show you why elasticity is an absolute killer for a horse. And which is why I always say bad compression is, is, is worse than no compression. If you're not going to follow these laws of graduated pressure and non-elastic, you shouldn't really be doing it, okay, because you can cause trouble. I mean, firstly, we know with graduated pressure, you know, things like socks that you pull on, they creep and they do this. So you end up with, you know, a pressure band here. And it's what's really interesting about pressure bands is, you know, lymph comes up and I'll show you on the next slide here. So this is um, a research that they did a while back in Hanover. The, um, the stringy bits that you can see on the front of the legs are actually um, um, little kind of injection cannulas that are pumping a contrast medium, a continuous flow of contrast medium up the lymphatic vessels of the leg. So when you look at the left hand image, you'll see the white lines on the back of the pastern, the back of the fetlock and running up the back of the cannon bone. These are the deep lymphatic collector vessels. These are the ones that you can constrict if you're putting far too much elasticity on the leg. Now on the left hand one, that's non-elastic pressure. OK, so if you follow from your from the from the hoof area and you follow up that up the back of the passage along, you can see that that dye is going through, you know, it's going through no problem. Look at what happens, especially along the cannon bone to that lymphatic vessel when it is compressed with elasticity. It's cut off. You basically cutting it off it won't work and when you realize that that happens that, that that is actually draining everything onto the skin it's draining the hoof structure the digital cushion it's the tendons the ligaments the bone the bone lining everything is being drained by those lymph vessels and so you imagine now that horse trying to recover from a tendon injury, sitting in a stable, vroom, suboptimum, straight away before you've done anything. And then they say, let's put some supportive elastic bandages on it. You're just not, you're just not doing it anymore. You could have the most expensive wound dressing in the world on that. And it's, I think we've completely forgotten how fast horses can heal because we're not doing it the right way. And this is scary, really scary, because it has a knock on effect to everything that you allow your vet to put on its leg, everything you're putting on the horse's leg. We have to be really, really mindful of this and we don't want this to happen. The other thing that happens is we get a thing called dermal backflow. So if you're doing this a lot, I'll try and show you on, on here. So you might, oh, so I'm probably better on my hand actually. So if you imagine that on my wrist, I've got an elastic band, okay? And now I've got lymph coming up here and it hits the elastic band. It wants to go through, but it can't. But what happens at the elastic band is it doesn't just go back down the deep collectors because it, it kind of can't because the lymph is coming up the collectors. So it can't really go back down them. So what happens is it goes from the deep and it, it comes out in the superficial. So then it starts pooling in the skin. So you've not only screwed up the, the flow of lymph up the deep collectors, but you're getting it back flowing dermally in the skin. And so now you're adding a lymphatic problem to the superficial system as well. <laughs> it's just really not a good thing to do, um, you know, because if, nothing's gonna work very well. So this is, this is scary and, simple when you know you know let's not put anything on their leg that's more than 10 percent elastic that's great and that's another reason why we have to use the cylinder because 
if we have a cylinder and we have our boundary going down, it's got nothing to, to slip down into. And if you've got a shape like this, like a Marilyn Monroe waist, everything's gonna slip down into the narrow part of the leg. So in a horse, it's gonna to slip to, you know, just above the fetlock joint, or it's gonna all slip around the pastons or, you know, and, it, and, and when it does that and ruckles up, you're causing a pressure band and potentially dermal backflow as well. So, you know, it, that, that's the reason why we use a cylinder because th these non-elastic bandages therefore can't slip down because they haven't got um, a concave section to slip into and cause constriction. So it does look a bit weird, but it's there for a reason, <laughs> you know? And sometimes when people are putting boots on, I'll say, well, you know, what you can do if, you, if you're worried about this happening and it's squashing in a bit is, you know, try and use a little bit of padding there so that you're not creating the shape where something could fall down into. Um, and so it's just like being mindful of, of, of the things that can go wrong. So any, any questions with that one at all? No, I'm just thinking of every time I've seen someone share a photo of their stable workaround bandage and Hannah has commented that it needs to be adjusted here or there. I'm always going to remember the image of these. Yeah, and we're not we're not a nightmare. I mean, we're like, I mean, seriously, like I work in this field now, but I remember, you know, I put I put elasticated bandages on my horses all my youth. I mean, you know, it was a terrible thing for me to come to terms with, to be honest. None of us are perfect. We're all learning. And, you know, you can't beat yourself up. We're all progressing. And, you know, with everything what we do you know we we've we've got to we've got to really we've got to be easy on ourselves at least we're here now tonight we're learning right. we're, we're improving you know we 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 can tell others we can you know we can share these images and and we can get it out there but yeah it is it is it is pretty pretty bad but yeah definitely you know if if you you learn the stable bandage workaround you know we definitely I mean, Hannah does a fantastic job and you know she and um Becca Smith as well so thinks she's become a, an expert on their um you know they're they're absolutely top at, 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 at analyzing every stable bandage workaround and getting them absolutely <laughs> spot on <laughs> we're not dragons though we're really nice I promise. <laughs> but I'm amazed actually the standard of what people do is phenomenally good and um yeah you know so so you know everyone gets it in the end it's just a bit fiddly so yeah any questions on that one no questions okay right so here is a beautiful example of a secondary lymphedema i'll just go through this quickly which is um this is actually um the horse at um the veterinary university at hanover that's in the berlin clinic um who came in with this massive secondary you can see uh, it's huge um, you can see all the fur has fallen off. You can see the tissue stages starting. You see the delamination of the hoof wall. It's lost all its fur. And this horse had it since it was a foal. And it came into clinic, I think, as a four-year-old. So this thing had been, you know, having problems for many, many years. And that is the result of, I think, eight days of active stage compression bandaging which is wow. actually not bad at all and um that that came right um and is still used as far as i know and this is one of the teaching horses there um and yeah they it's incredible what you can achieve really amazing they they respond a lot better than humans which is why they're more fun to treat really um once you've got your leg down and then we're in maintenance this goes back again to you know what good compression is and um you know you can use people have been trying to compress legs for a very long time and if i look at my old victorian um english victorian horsemanship books from you know 1812 or whatever um it, it was quite well known, you know, that shires and Suffolk punches and other working breeds would get swollen legs if they were in the stable. And in some places in England where we had a heavy clay soil or availability to clay, these um, horsemen were actually packing their horses' legs with clay um, in the stables. And obviously as the clay shrinks um, and dries, it forms non-elastic pressure. 
they were they were pretty bright they knew what they were doing um and so that's obviously we don't want to do that <laughs> because you know you need a groom to do that <laughs> a lot of work um but you know it shows that they they had the right track and also look at my mother's stable bandaging from you know 1950s 1960s and these were felt you know there was no stretch in these things at all you had to know what you were doing to put these on a horse's leg you know this is when people were quite sort of skilled in a way in practical um, vocational way um so when we think about compression garments we talk about flat knit and circular knit um and this is just a um um, quite useful way of, of thinking about whether something's suitable for your horse. So round knit is kind of like a sock. It's spun on a on a round like this. So it spins, you know, sort of narrow for an ankle and then wider for a calf, and then narrower at the knee and wider for a thigh. And you end up with a shaped stocking. Now these sadly are not suitable for horses because um, of the, you know, con it will always creep, which we, it will always move into the um, concave areas. And also they're usually pulled on over the hoof, which means that when you pull a tube over the hoof, the first area where you want quite well the most pressure is from the coronary band along the pastern, but of course that's a very narrow area and they don't really give much pressure, and then they give too much pressure on the fatlock joint, and so they're not they're not ideal. They're very difficult to keep up, and as soon as the horse moves, they tend to just move, and they, they, these are really susceptible to rub wounds. Now flat knits is very much for anyone that knows how to do dressmaking or tailoring is a question of cutting out panels and then sewing them together in a shape like, you know, one flat panel and another flat panel. And there you've got a, you know, you've got a kind of a pull on sock type thing. Now, the trouble with um, flat knit is you have to watch out with those because quite often they're not very good over articulating joints. So if you imagine something like flat knit and there's your joint and your joint moves you can get terrible rub wounds from this and in human lymphedema we know this to be a problem and when we compress a human leg we can't compress them all in one go with a flat knit garment we have to do a foot bit and then a lower leg bit and then a knee bit and then a thigh bit and each of those overlap and again this is quite difficult for a horse as well <laughs> because they just have really unusual and terrible legs um and so you really have to use a special guy so like uh, it, it's very very difficult to, to get the right thing and then of course if you get the right garment then you've got to make sure that it's is is applied with graduated pressure and you know it's not going to move um when we talk about compression we talk about grades one to four um, and we call them compression classes. Um, compression class one is the lowest grade of compression, and then compression two is 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 higher, and three is higher still, and four is you know pretty much wetsuit material for humans. That's pretty savage stuff. You know, you break out a sweat trying to pull them on. In horses, we need less pressure because um, you've got no musculature below the knee and the hock, a vulnerable area, but we also know that we can affect the superficial and the deep. So we don't, we always, well, there is no set compression class for a horse, but because we know that about this, these biomechanical problems with them, we know that we would always err to lower compression. So class one, class two, possibly a class three. And personally, I would never use a class four on a horse. I think it's far too much. Um, and how we grade these is we have under pressure bandage monitors. Do you remember those whoopee cushions <laughs> you used to get yeah. as a kid? They look like those. You open up the bandage, you pop your little whoopee cushion on there. It has a little wire. You put your compression on that goes to a little under bandage pressure monitor and it tells you what your pressure is. So then you can gauge what you're actually putting on the leg because what one person's light is not what somebody else's light pressure is, especially when you're looking at, you know, four foot 11 girl with that's, you know, previously broken a wrist compared to a six foot two, you know, Australian vet that, you know, is bouldering in there because he's been playing, you know, rugby or whatever, you know, pressures are going to go wild. 
So you have to be very careful of understanding what pressure you're putting on the leg. And that's the good thing about the stable bandage workaround. The way we design that, we know that if your bandage is less than 10% stretch and you've padded it all out and it's on the cylinder and you put the bandage that way, you have a nice class two pressure. So you can rest assured. And that only took me about, I don't know, 40 hours of scrabbling around on a horse floor to do it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh well. Anyway, um, yeah, so be careful as well, because um, a lot of people are getting on the compression bandwagon now. You'll hear it in sports because um, because you'll hear, oh, you know, all sports people need to be in compression. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, they do. Um, but again, a lot of these companies are just selling um, cool looking stuff, but without really understanding the art and science behind it. So whenever you are um, putting even a human being in a sock, a compression sock, you would take a toe measurement, an arch of the foot measurement, a sideways measurement around the ankle, an ankle, an above ankle, a mid, um, a, a lower, widest part of calf, and two inches below, the, two fingers width below the um, crease of the knee. So we're looking at a lot of measurements for just, you know, foot to knee sock. Um, and that's really important because these things that people are saying, you know, put people in flight socks, uh-uh, because you, they only come in like small, medium, large, and you could have eight people all the same height, but they're all going to have different shaped legs. And if you don't get the pressure right, so all lymphatic compression is, is measured, like measured to hell, because you, you know, we understand the importance of making sure that everything is fitting properly. And it's the same with horses. Always, if you see anything advertised, use, your, use what you've learned here. Okay. Are the bindings more than 10% stretch? Is the garment more than 10% stretch? Can I do it? Can I put it on in grad, using graduated pressure? Is it a round knit garment? How are they going to stop that creeping? Is it a flat knit garment? How are they going to stop that from rubbing? Is it put on at the right pressure? How can I make sure it's the right pressure? And how can I make sure that I'm not over or under tensioning it? These are the issues. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any questions on that one? <laughs> Um, now just underscores seeing, you know, all those posts in the CPL Facebook group of different products that are out on there on the market. This, this really helps explain very clearly why those are not uh, good options for horses with CPL. Yeah. And I want them. I want good options. Right. I would love, I would love more stuff. Believe you me, I really would. Um, because we've got very little and we need more. You know, we really, really do. Um, you know, if we had, I wish I'd look at surgery. I wish I'd look at other things. But, you know, sadly, the stuff that's coming out really is the same old, same old. There's nothing new out there. And, you know, a lot of it isn't really that suitable, to be fair. And also, we're kind of bad as humans as well. We want to um, we want to have a machine or a, an amazing whiz bang thing, you know, with dials and flashing lights and stuff. But, you know, sadly, it, there's nothing really that's a one hit thing. We can't cure this thing. We can only manage this thing. And, and what we have in management is actually quite basic. But I used to get so depressed about it, thinking, you know, why don't we have anything amazing? But actually now, I think it suits us quite well because at least we can use the stable bandage workaround. We can do that. We can use it with stuff that we can find fairly easily as horse owners, and we can learn how to do it, and we can support it. We don't have to go to the vet or pay for expensive diagnostics. We can do it. This is great. So I, I look, I don't get depressed about it now. I think, no, no, this is actually okay. Stable bandage workaround is there for the world. At least people can use it. And, and at least, okay, it's a little bit fiddly, but at least we can get hold of the stuff and we can do it ourselves. And that's great, you know, it works, it's safe, we can do it. And, you know, we're Hannah and the team and are all there ready to help anybody wanting to do it. That's for sure. <laughs> um, any questions on that one? No questions. Okay, so, um, yep, this is just very quickly to show you about the problems of compression classes. <laughs> oh. 
Remember when I was saying that the human grades of, of the stages of lymphedema don't match the horse stages? Well, here's another lovely problem that we have. I mean, these are all up on the Equilymph site. So, you know, in the facts, so you can always refer back to this or, or this part you know, when you see the, the this presentation again. Bear in mind that, remember I said four compression classes, they're measured in millimeters of mercury, um, which is, um, the way we measure it and um class one now you would think that the whole world would agree what a class one garment was wouldn't you and they said that they don't um so you can see by the chart if you look at the top line class one which is in black you'll see that the british standard in the uk will will say that class one is between 14 and 17 millimeters of mercury when you go to Germany, they'll say, oh, no, we think that class one is between 18 and 21 millimeters of mercury. And when you go to the USA, they'll say it's 15 to 20. Okay. So always bear in mind which country is calling it class one and what is it? <laughs> because otherwise you could prescribe and, and the French also have their own. Um, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, well, the French will always do things differently. You know, that's why. <laughs> The French have an AFNOR standard. Now, I use RAL, I use German because I think they're fantastic. And I will always, and it always says on the Equilymph website, whenever I'm talking about compression class, I will always be using RAL. And most compression garment manufacturers around the world will use RAL, even an English um, compression manufacturing company like Medi, who based in Herefordshire, will put their compression classes in RAL and they'll put the other ones in brackets. But it's always something to look out for because, you know, there is quite a significant difference. Not so bad with humans because we've got our muscles as to act as a buffer, but seriously big problem with, you know, if you look at the bottom range of UK being 14, and the top range of Germany being 21, well, you know, exactly. that's all considered class one, but you really want to be aiming between 14 and 16. You don't want to be going higher than that. Well, I would go 18 to 21 on Germany and then not more. And then, and again, on class four, I very, very, very rarely use class three ever. Um, and then you can get a different thing. So I have used class three, uh, say, so let's pretend this is a leg and I've used class three on the bottom. And I've used class two on the top um, where you've got massive scar tissue. So this was a horse that had numerous surgeries um, over a pastern from a non-healing wound and all sorts of nasties. And it just needed a little bit extra there. So you can mix compression, but it is, is difficult. But always be aware that every country doesn't standardize its compression. Um, <laughs> but at least you know there is a chart. We made one for you. Um, so you can you can refer to that whenever you need to, okay? <laughs> Any oh, questions on that one? No, no questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a good thing of I'm not ever going to show your horse in bad compression because you know it just you know I just don't want to I, I just sort of there's, I don't want to see it ever. <laughs> but this is the example of what happens when lymphedema clinics get it wrong and they do quite often. So here is a hand that we're trying to compress and somebody has decided that they haven't put the right um, compression class on and it's all ruckling and you can see that the hand is now starting to swell because the lymph can't get out of the hand and it's all a nightmare. So these are the type of things that go wrong. I see them all the time or I used to when I was in human practice. It's just this is a very common thing. Um, even if you take all your measurements correctly, people do funny things. People go home and they say, you know, I don't really feel like I like this bit around my thumb. So they cut it off with scissors and the whole thing starts oh. to go mental. So, you know, never cut your compression, <laughs> always apply it correctly. But bear in mind that even if you do everything correctly, sometimes something funny happens and things can move around because you know at the end of the day we're moving beings and we're putting you know material on there so you know things can go wrong um so what the hell so what did i do so basically i, I gave up having a life of my own <laughs> and um i thought oh geez you know what am i going to do because i can go out and i can put multi-layer -limb, limb, uh, multi lymphedema bandages on horses and I can compress them, but there's nothing I can put in them as a maintenance garment. Okay, so this was a big problem for me. 
um, because otherwise, you know, I couldn't really go out and treat anything because I'll say, well, yeah, I can get your horse's leg down, but I can't, I can't do anything else for it. Now, you can maintain horses in multi-layer lymphedema bandages, but my God, you know, this is going to be very, very expensive and time consuming and horrendous. So we were trying to do everything we could. And in the end, I thought, well, you know, I think I'm just going to have to find somebody that's going to knit me knit me a special material that fits between a round knit and a flat knit that has the ability to move and flex over joints um but isn't a round knit so i i yeah it took two years to get this done um anyway so this is the boots that we use for um the non-feathered legs um and the um they have different graphics because it's easier. So the red and white stripe is a class one and the blue chevrons is a class two. Um, they're made to measure and you can see the white tension markers labeled one to five up the leg. And if you look at number one, you'll see that it's a rectangular shape. And as you go up the leg, it's much more of a square shape. And how this works is it stops you over tensioning and it gets the graduated pressure. So when you put the boot on and you pull it, the rectangle then becomes a square visually and you have your perfect pressure up the leg. OK, and these things just fit and flex and they don't move. However, the problem was when we went to try them on a feathered leg. <laughs> And the feather is just too strong um, and it just, the boot doesn't have enough pressure to press against the hair. We tried clipping the legs and it works fine until the hair starts to grow back and it gets to the stubbly stage. And then it, it basically lifts the compression boot off the leg and the whole thing falls down. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll have to go and do this, solve this then. Um, and so we have, um, this is a model leg, by the way. I haven't chopped a leg off or anything. Uh, so this is the double wrap, um, which is actually now just literally going out uh, my second run now, actually, to um, around the UK fitting. Uh, I've not so, seen this yet. This is very oh, exciting. No, no, no. I only took the photos this morning on my new model leg. You see. Oh, I, so you guys, this is the world <laughs> premiere of the double wrap. <laughs> I mean, there are horses in it because it's been tested for the last year um and the first batch is literally like being picked up this week and I'm, I'm literally driving up to the north of England and then driving around fitting them all on the first horses in the world so this is cool this is very wow. very cool so, so would this be appropriate for a Frisian horse or the first yes, that you should? yeah yeah and what they are is I'll just quickly flip so what you've got um well if you look at the right hand thing you've got You've got your um, past, what I call the Paston pad, and you've got a Cannon pad. Now, we know with CPL legs, they start off as regular legs, then they get the skin folds, and then as they progress, they become more teardrop shaped, like an inverted traffic cone, okay? Now, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to make the cylindrical shape. So if you look at the Paston pad from the side, the first, the left image, you can see that I've pulled the seam down and you can see you've got an internal pocket and then you can see that there's a little bit of sort of like honeycomb fabric mm -hmm. that is thicker that we can put into that pocket to shim out underneath the paston. So instead of the pastons being like that, they're now going to be nice and flat. And likewise, on the cannon pad, which is on the right hand picture, you can see that we can put shim material in the sides so that we can shim those out as well. Um, those are put on with zero pressure on the leg. So you can see that you start to build up that shape. You can also, um, you can also let's say you've got a massive skin fold coming around the leg. So, you know, on the sides, you can actually just pad above it or below it and then on each side. And that way the skin folds are just nicely contained within your shims, okay? And then once you've made that, you have the wrap garment, which is the blue chevron on top. Again, this is all kind of breathable and the, you know, if it gets wet, it dries because inside is um, filaments. So, um, so if you imagine two very thin pieces of fabric and in between you've got these filaments. So 
when the fabric moves, the filament moves as well. So it mimics the laminar flow of skin. Um, so when you're going over an articulating joint, it flexes and doesn't move. Um, and then the same thing with the pressure on the outside with the blue chevrons, you've got your, it's very easy to do up because um, you, again, you just follow those white tension squares and then um, it's restricted. If you look at the top, you'll see the um, in between the tension square is a, a, a line of, of pale gray stitching. Well, those stitch, those pale gray stitches stop the, it restricts the elasticity to under 10%. And then um, you can also use that stitch line as a 50% overlap marker so that you're always overlapping at 50% so that you've got proper um, pressure all the way up. Because if you put like, you know, one strap and then over another and over another, if you're not overlapping it by 50%, you can end up with, you know, too much pressure. Um, so it's fairly, it's safe and it's, and oh my God, you know, it, it, it works. So thank God, you know, and this is the alternative to the stable bandage workaround. You know, they both work. Um, it's the only difference is this is quicker. <laughs> yeah. So as you shift this, yeah. Wash uh, yeah. Can you put uh, these in the wash? Yeah, washable at 40, they're mite repellent. Um, they- um, Mite repellent too. Yeah, the mites don't like them at all. Um, wow, like a, but, that's like a superpower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mites hate them. I mean, that's not to say that the mites, if they're in the leg, they'll stay in the leg, they will. But, you know, at least they're not burrowing into the material of this yeah, gotcha. fashion garment and living in there like they can do in, in other fabrics and stuff. And so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's it now. Um, so, so we have those and the only, the, 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 only, the only ones we don't have right now is late stage C and D CPL scores because these legs get massive. So we have to increase the strap width to go over folds because you imagine you've got a fold that's you know, small you only need a small strap there but if you have a massive fold that's big you'd need a bigger strapping and also we've changed the um we've changed the shimming on the cannon pad because if we know that we have an angle of 10 percent if it's over 10 percent we have to shim a little bit more on the top half of the cannon pad but that's coming through already that's on test now um and working okay so it's good yeah yeah it's good it's good but i mean i never wanted to bring these out into the world they're very difficult to make they are a complete nightmare to make actually to be honest because the material is so weird and you have to hand make it it's not like you can send it off to china and i i thought you know this is actually if i bring this to market it's immoral you know we can't have horses uncompressed if the owners have financial difficulty and they can't afford to get these boots or whatever so at least we always have stable bandage workaround Right. Um, you know, because I, I don't want to lie in bed at night thinking, you know, I, there are horses that, you know, in trouble out there that, you know, because the owners have got problems or whatever. I mean, I know what it's like as a young um, horse owner and, you know, thinking who's going to eat today, <laughs> my horse or myself. <laughs> but, you know, so so it's, it's a good thing. And I hope that with the, you know, with the money that we get from these things, we can put it back into research and, we can start to send these boots off to Hanover and have them have the legs injected with dye and we can start to see how the tissue quality improves. And then when the members pages come online, you'll have um, the ability to put your horse's measurements and the press and stretch test in there so that you can see how it's going along through the year. And then we can start to get data so we can start to say, okay, well, the horses that were, you know, within this parameter of CPLB that were shoved in compression, they're showing tissue quality improvements in six months and we're pulling them back, we're improving them. So if they were, you know, late stage B, we've pulled them back to a, a late stage A um you know we'll be able to see what's going on and we'll also be able to see when we've got a big data set you know okay what type of horses are being affected you know we can put in a, a lot about the breeding we can try to um you know preempt things so that people hopefully won't buy from a horse that has this so that saves us all a lot of heartache and we can say you know in the secondary lymphedemas you know i know that from my practice i'm seeing it a lot in big warp bloods and uh, and, and racehorses off the track 
but you know it'd be great to say okay well these horses are spending you know certain proportion of their life in stables that mm -hmm. gives them a, a you know whatever percentage more chance of developing this in the future and then we can start to say okay well if we then compress you know a hundred race horses as they go through training you know do they develop lymphatic incompetence later in their life at least we're starting to answer some of these questions but we're never going to answer the questions unless we do it in you know proper scientific way we have to collect data um so when those number of pages go up you know i really implore you all please use it because you know um it, every every bit of information we have will go to serve to understand the disease and to learn new techniques and Im improve the you know um prognosis for um, for, the, for these horses you know we be good and we hope to link with you know breed societies and all sorts in the future if we can so that that's where we're at in a minute um hence i'm a saddo that never goes out <laughs> never, i literally sit in a factory all day going oh my god <laughs> what am i doing here anyway there we are um any questions on that one i don't have any questions at the moment okay cool right so other treatments and this comes into what you were talking about before angie a little bit about um you know what the hell else can we use um sometimes you'll see things like um people advertising intermittent compression devices and this is one that yeah. i think somebody sent to germany now these are um pneumatic compressions so they're put you we use them in human medicine in human lymphedema clinics but but with caveats uh, okay so what happens is when you do lymph drainage you are affecting the pulsation of the little angines in those deep collector vessels and you're encouraging lymph into them because you're you're stretching the skin in a certain way so that you're actually getting interstitial fluid into the lymphatic system when you're doing pneumatic compression it doesn't really do that it's a kind of like a let's just bish bash it all around and we hope that some goes up it's not very um, directional, shall we say? It's more like boom, 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 you know, and it hopes to just pressurize things up. And this isn't that great um, because it can, yeah, well, nobody's particularly really, I mean, they're keen on it in human lymphedema clinics if somebody has very, very bad tissue, and then they might pop that person on that machine for 20 minutes. But then that human has to go in to a manual lymph drainage practitioner, have lymph drainage done, and then be put in compression. So it's not a standalone thing. So save your money, don't bother, put your horse in compression instead. This machine, this thing is about, I know, six grand. You don't want to, like, don't bother. I'll keep your horse in compression for the rest of his life. Um, People often ask whether there's medication for um, lymphedema, and the answer is no, there isn't. There have been people trying all sorts of weird stuff, but there generally is not um, a medicine for this. Um, because basically you're looking at pipes that are so damaged that they can't work anymore. And so, you know, they can regenerate up to a certain extent, but once they can't regenerate anymore, that's it. It's like saying, if I, you know, give you, uh, if I give you aspirin, will that, cure the scar on your hand that you got when you were 10 is it's not going to do it um because it's you know you're looking at physical damage um one thing you have to be quite mindful of is diuretics which we also call as water tablets in the uk sometimes they are really contraindicated in lymphedema um, the reason why is because you go back to the washing up bowl analogy. One of the things that the lymphatics take away are protein molecules. And so it sucks those up and puts them back into the, the um, venous return into the veins. Um, now, if you're using diuretics, it takes the water element out, but it leaves the protein behind. So you've basically made a more concentrated solution of protein those proteins love water so they attract twice the water back to them and you've literally messed up the whole thing you might as well kind of not bothered in humans sometimes if you've got somebody in heart failure they do need diuretics to stay alive and then that is a you know massive concern for people like me that have to match the needs of you know keeping somebody alive on heart meds and also stopping their legs from swelling 
but we don't have this problem in horses. So if your vet says, oh, we'll just give it water tablets because it's a water leg, that's, don't do it. You'll just make it worse. Um, there's no proven, scientifically proven diet for lymphedema, although we know that weight should be kept low and we know that people should be eating, you know, what we should be eating, like salads and stuff. And with horses, we know from Hannah's good work on her page, um, getting horses off sugar and onto um, more natural forage-based diets are a lot easier. We know that marigold and cleavers has a mild diuretic effect. And one thing that when the whole marigold and cleavers thing got um, picked up momentum was um, one of my colleagues is a vet who did a four year postgraduate herbal uh, pharmacology um, degree on top of her veterinary degree. And I asked her to what degree the marigold or calendula as Latin name would be affecting the leg um, in a, you know, from a diuretics point of view, because I was concerned that it might be too strong. But she assured me that absolutely not is a very, very, very mild uh, generic effect and nowhere near the level of commercial diuretics. So you don't need to worry about those. Um, the other thing is um, surgery. Um, we only started looking at surgery in human lymphatics um, only literally not that long ago, like 15 years ago. And the reason why is because it's super microsurgery. And um, when you have surgical tools, you have to put them into an autoclave to um, disinfect them. Um, and the tools were so fine and so small that the autoclaves were breaking the tools. So it wasn't a question that it couldn't be done. It was a question if we didn't have the technology to be able to get the, the super micro surgical tools through autoclave. Since they have developed better tools, they started to look at it with a vascular surgeon started to look at this. Um, and what they do in human medicine is very new. Um, and they call it lymphovenous anastomosis, which is basically a way of saying, OK, so that's your lymph vessel and it's damaged, it's broken. But here is a vein and they will they will scan the lymphatics, obviously, so they can see where all the problems are. And then they will take the lymphatic vessel and they will literally using super microsurgical techniques, graft it onto a vein. OK, and then the vein will take the lymph out of the leg. Now, this is you think it's going to be a miracle cure, but actually it isn't. Um, in, in, in 10 human patients that I've had to go through it, I think two found it really useful and it did actually help them. Um, some got worse and some just stayed the same. Um, and so, you know, and, and the surgeons are very, very canny on who they take. And it's actually not a be all and end all because um, these patients still have to wear compression all the time anyway. It's not a way to get out of compression. Um, it's, and, and also the other thing to, to be mindful of is that the veins will be taking a certain amount of fluid back to the heart and lungs for reoxygenation. If you've suddenly taken, you know, four lymph vessels and you've grafted them all onto a vein, we don't know and we don't have enough patients right now to know whether you're increasing the cardiac preload. Are you putting too much fluid back to the heart? Are you going to end up with heart problems later in life? And likewise, you know, we don't we just don't know. We don't, we don't know. And this doesn't exist in horses either. The other thing that surgery, surgery can do is lymph node um, transplants. And these have been used to varying degrees of success, but then again, have a massive Achilles heel. So let's say I've got lymphedema of the left leg, because my inguinal nodes in my groin aren't great. So they could take out an auxiliary node and transplant that into my groin. But everyone is networked differently. Some people are networked like spider's web. So you take one node out and the whole thing still works. Some of them are, are networked like dartboards. You take out the bullseye and the whole dartboard falls apart. You can be really unlucky and have one lymph node taken from axilla. You can end up with lymphedema of the, of the arm. <laughs> so, you know, these poor people, 
you know, trying to cure lymphedema in one limb and end up with it in two limbs, you know. So it's one of these things that's very, very difficult and one that I would probably say, hmm, you know, wait on it because actually it's not be all and end all anyway even if you have lymphedemus and anastomosis or even if you have lymph node transplant you still have to wear compression it is not a way out um, other things people have done in the past is surgical debulking they it's pretty much banned now <laughs> if you ever hear that word don't let anyone do it to your horse i don't think they would ever do it anyway um, and um, they have tried to use um, tumescent liposuction um, and vasolipo, which is heat guided um, vibrational sort of lipo to reduce the bulk, the, the size of a leg in lymphedema. That can work, but you have to have a surgeon that really knows what they're doing and they've got to run the cannulas up against, you know, together with the lymph node vessels, because if they run them that way, they'll they'll literally smash through all the lymph vessels and cause trouble. Um, so there's a whole load of stuff going on. Uh, none of it is great. <laughs> and none of it will get you out of compression anyway. So like, just stick to stick to that and don't worry. And you know, like, you know, this, this will be a lot of money as well. So, you know, we, we just don't have yeah. Anyway, have, any, any questions? Yeah, several questions now. So um, the first one, away. Debbie, she wants to know if we don't have access to the Fibrogy pads, what can we use instead? Oh, right. Uh, yes, I need to find somebody in the States who I can send shed loads of Fibrogy pads out to because they are the best because they breathe and they are relatively light and they're, and they're cheap. Um, you can use padding, but what you need to be careful of is foamy type stuff that makes the legs sweat underneath because we don't really want sweating if we can. Felt uh, can be fairly good if you have all like baize type material because it at least is somewhat breathable and you can sew it into layers uh, relatively easy and it's relatively cheap. Um, that, uh, that, that's kind of the only options to you. Uh, really, it it, ha it has been really hard for you guys to find that stuff in America, I know. Um, and I mean, you know, if somebody wants to contact me, please by email, I would be happy to send out 100 of them to America to then be, you know, transferred to people. Um, but um, yeah, it is a difficult one. Um, I'll link up with you. We The Fenway Foundation yeah, yeah, will be able yeah. to help you with that. So we can link up on that. Yeah, so, I mean, look at different kind of day. look at different kind of waddings. Sometimes, you know, like in England, we were really big on like those plasticky tablecloth type things for you know, so children could you know spill things all over the kitchen table without wrecking the wood. But underneath that, you sometimes have this like cottony wadding, um, you know. And so, what what I have known somebody do is they found cotton based wadding, and they've made a felt. Um, uh, envelope and filled the envelope with cotton wadding and then use that but that this is you know more advanced sewing skills um i hate to say um and me i mean despite me make having a company that makes compression i i can't sew i'm terrible <laughs> at it um but you know so so there are our ways around it you know so interlining of um curtains that can sometimes work but again you have to kind of get it into a pocket but if i was going to use a pocket i would use felt okay heather asked the question in your opinion do horse treats things like carrots sugar cubes have a significant enough impact for horses with cpl that's best to avoid that her horse is very treat motivated oh. so I will chime in, uh, Heather, we do positive reinforcement training with our horses and it's always best to use the lowest value reinforcer possible. So we actually start with Timothy hay pellets and most horses are quite happy to have that as a treat. Just a small handful, just a few pieces of hay pellets can achieve the same thing actually. What do yeah, you think? Sometimes you can get the little pepperminty one, you know, sent sort of slightly pepperminty flavored ones as well, can't you? That 
give them that little bit of extra if they but like you say sometimes it's a transition between these high value sweet treats and then it's the same as when you're trying to start drinking coffee without sugar and you know it takes a little while right. and then you and then you get there so you can spray them with a little bit of apple juice or um, you know, even blend the carrots in a blender and then just put that over your little Timothy Hay pellets and keep them in the fridge or somewhere so they don't go moldy or whatever. But and then you can lower the amount of the sweetness. I mean, I'm not a nutritionist here. I, I really am not. And I, 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 I mean, I suppose it's what comes down to, you know, like how much forage your animal, horse is, is having and how many carrots. I mean, you know, like one a day probably isn't going to be horrendous. But if you're like feeding, you know, 10 kilo bag every week they're probably not that bad probably not that good for them but um you know yeah i would definitely agree with angie try to use the low cal um treats you know fibery treats if you can um but i'm i'm not qualified to answer the question because it's not my area of expertise i'm sure hannah and people on the page will have a much better idea sure hannah me. would have an opinion Hannah will have an opinion. How, <laughs> Hannah will have the answer. She's a good girl. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's, uh, I think that's it for now. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Right. Um, um, okay. So a lot of people will say, right, I've got this horse now. What the hell am I going to do? Um, and, you know, and I will always say to people, well, it's worse for us in England because we've got a lot less space. Um, and half of our island is muddy and wet <laughs> so people will fight mud all the time um but then you know the west coast of america is going to be the same so you know just have to deal with what we have to deal with so hardly any owners are going to be able to do everything but keep the analogy of the um of the egg timer in in your mind when you're thinking about weekly monthly or yearly management we're trying to stop the sand from going through basically i will try to always say to people try to get your horse moving as much as you can if you pop them on a track system or you're encouraging movement in any way that is going to be the best thing for your horse and we know that the horses that have been stuck, especially ones, the, the gypsy cobs, for example, in the UK, which are there are loads of them, they're you know, indiscriminately bred with no passports and, and dumped on tiny little fields with very little grass. And there's a massive welfare issue here with these animals. Um, and if they are, if, if they're unable to move and then they get mite damage and then, you know, they're not fed very well and then they, you know, have it, they will deteriorate really quickly whereas if you got the same animal as a foal and you moved it you know you, he was walking around and he was well looked after and he never got any mite infestations his you know his, his he would go at a much slower rate um but you know the more they can move the better anything you can do to make the move the better um you know that is number one really of anything you can do and then number two is is you know compress when they're in um safely um, otherwise don't do it um, and and monitor you know use your brains think okay right well you know I've, I've turned my horse out more has it worked and this is another thing to bear in mind and I was uh, laughing with Hannah about it the other day I said god if we were horrible people we could say here let's have our amazing supplement and I'll sell it to you in December and I'll say you know by in four months time you'll see an amazing improvement in your lymphedema but actually, it could be just full of sand or whatever, but <laughs> or, I don't know, flour. And, you know, if your horse is stabled in the winter and then he goes out in the spring, he will improve. Um, and then, you know, it, it wouldn't be our miraculous supplement. It would just be the fact that the horse is actually out now. So moving, moving, moving. When you start to take them out of a stable, even if they are compressed, their lymphatic systems, as I said before, are not like ours. They are suboptimum. And actually, in a weird way, we should be warming up our horses a lot longer anyway. We should be giving them half an hour. And I would say that 20 minutes to half an hour of a warm up, walking, 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 is also good for their joints. It gets a sign of your fluid going. Then they're ready to work. You know, don't just take them out and start hammering up and down hills or whatever. Just give them that time and give them time to cool down as well. So if you've had a lovely canter through a field in the summer and they've come back hot, 
you know, try and walk them around a bit, you know, before they go back into the stable, make sure that they're really cool or they've had a little bit of extra time walking so that you've given them that time to, to go from suboptimum to working and then easing back down. Um, I know I was saying get familiar with the skin territories of your horse, so know where the skin territories are for the front legs and the hind legs. Make sure that those are protected because any injury to them could overload that area. So on a hind leg, let's say if you had an accident to the stifle, it would probably make the lymphedema worse because that area is now being affected by an injury. That's normal. Um, but you can use your intelligence here and you can say, okay, well, if that's happening, I'm going to try and walk them more, um, you know, or I might at the end when the stifle's healed, I might need to just put them in compression for a little bit longer to just get that normalized again. Um, with geldings, especially if you're in an area with biting midges, the whole underside around the sheath and in mares around the teats, especially because they've got no fur there. Um, you need to protect those if you're getting get any biting insects because you know so you want to um, put um, insect repellent or anti-biting midge cream on there because that can also if that area gets bitten or anything it can cause that skin territory to overload you don't want to really give them injections or acupuncture or heavy massage um, in those areas because again, you don't want to um, have a risk of secondary infection and you also don't want to increase filtrate into that area specifically if you have to, because, um, you know, it's needed for any other health purpose, then, you know, you know, make sure that the whole area is very, very clean and that you're looking after it and keep an eye on it and you're, you're doing everything you can. Um, you need to be mindful of things like over girthing, tight fitting tack, um, especially in um, racing, polo, where, you know, um, the girths or the cinches are done up very, very tight because that sits in a skin territory and can cause scarring, which means then that it's harder for the lymph to come back to the return point of the external jugular veins. Um, you need to be very mindful, as we've seen, from elasticated bandage or elasticated products, and that goes for veterinary products too. Um, the other thing you need to be mindful of is cold. Um, tap water cold is fine. Um, absolutely no problem with that. Walking in the rivers and lakes and going to the beach, fine, because they're moving you know, not a problem. But what you have to watch out for is any product using ice or anything that's colder than tap water. And the reason for this is, it's a big con, again, um, that what happens to the microcirculation, and this is tiny, tiny, you know, where the tiny arterials, the tiny venules, the tiny little in, in, uh, lymphatic vessels, if you subject them to strong cold, and the whole, what happens is the microcirculation shuts down, slows down, okay? This is especially true with those ice spa things. Then you take the horse out of the ice spa and everything heats up very, very quickly. So what happens is where everything was stopped, suddenly you get a massive flooding of arterial blood into the interstitial, because suddenly it's just opened up. It's like a dam whoosh all comes rushing in now the people with the ice spa take a sample and they say isn't our ice spa magnificent because you know we've got way more oxygen in there and way more nutrients we've improved the circulation isn't it great and so yeah that's great how do you get it out of the leg how do you get that out answer Ugh, they don't know and and what you've done is you just overloaded a system that's struggling anyway and it annoys me because it's bad science and um, it hasn't really understood the idea of how the lymphatic system actually works, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's, it's very, very, it, it, that annoys me a lot. But, you know, as you can tell, I should I'd be, be quiet now before I go on a rant. Um, <laughs> and ice as well, you don't use ice for the same reason. Heat, you need to also be careful of. Um, so sometimes, you know, people will say, look, I've only got a small field, it's got no shelter at all, um, on a really hot day, my 20 year old horse just stands there baking in the sun, you know, and I say, well, no, just bring them in. If they're just going to be standing still in the hot sun, 
you know, swelling, they might as well be standing still in the shade with compression on because that, you know, is a good thing. Oh, and a good thing to also note with compression in hot, hot climates is um, you can reverse, you know, you can turn them out at night and compress them in the day in a stable. Obviously, we can we can do that. But if you find and, and I have had a lot of horses in the double wrap, which is the, the garment that I showed you, that they were getting quite warm in the day. And I was saying, you know, don't let them sweat in those. Um, you can use if you've got two skin folds like this and you notice that when you put your finger inside, you think uh, it's a little bit sweaty and wet in there. Um, if it's damp, but not sweaty, if it's sweaty, just take the whole thing off. If it's damp, you can use um, children's diapers or which we call nappies in the UK and you can cut little squares and then you could just literally put them into the fold. Um, you can actually use um, thin sanitary towels as well, folded in half into the folds, and then put the compression on because those have super absorbent technology and they will wick the moisture away from the skin fold and into the pad. But of course, they would need changing and, and looking at. And if you think, no, nah, this is just getting a little bit too wet now, just you, you just take it off. That's, that's you know, you, there's no point a horse sweating in these garments because it's just not worth it. You might as well just take them out of it for a bit, wait for a cooler spell. Um, the other thing, you know, saunas, but hot water, um, stuff like that, again, you know, increases filtrate. So you want to try and keep them at temperate um, um, things, uh, temperatures. Massage, um, again, you can use it at different points in the horse, but not um, the skin territories which are affected with CPL or lymphedema. Um, and if you need to, let's say, you know, they've twisted something and there's a muscle in spasm and that needs help, um, then do it, but then walk the horse afterwards, you know, so it's getting a chance to get over that. Um, and the other thing that's important is ad lib forage um, because of the 8,000 nodes that the horse has. Um, 4,000 4, are in the ascending colon, and one, there's such a massive hind gut with the peristaltic action of the intestines. Do you remember from the last session, the lymph vessels hitch a ride on that peristaltic action? So having a nice um, trickle feeding through the digestion also helps the lymphatics as well. If you have a horse that's prone to weight gain, you need to figure out ways of getting forage into them um, without gaining weight and that you'd have to talk to um, somebody other than me because it's not my area of specialty but you know things like slow feeders or soaking or you know the nutrients out of hay or whatever whatever all of the tricks that we use to, to stop them doing that is all really useful so any questions on daily management and care at all yeah, I've got a few. Uh, what about the uh, salt water therapy? I've seen the answer to that question, but I'll let you. Yeah, um, salt water is fine. Um, salt, I mean, a lot of people will ask, you know, can I take my horse with CPL to the beach? Um, and, you know, salt water is okay, but it's drying. Uh, you must yeah. remember that it's drying. Um, and so you'd need to um, make sure afterwards that you apply a good emollient and make sure that you know everything's okay. If you go to the beach, you would want to make sure, especially if you have folds, that you're not getting any sand um, stuck in the folds where you can rub and cause friction wounds. So you just need to be a little bit extra vigilant with that. With that. So so long as you're aware of the potential drying nature of salt and also the um, the potential abrading, abrading action of sand. And this also goes for arena surfaces, especially where you've got wax sand. Um, bear in mind that if you are using boot protective boots, you need to make sure that the arena surfaces aren't working up underneath them and rubbing. Some people will keep um, one of those pump action sprayers by the uh, um, arena gate and then they'll literally whip the boots off and then just pump action dilute hippy scrub over the legs so that it's made sure it's completely clean or they'll hose them down 
Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the microfiber cloths and towels just to sort of pat things dry and then just make sure that everything is nicely emoliated. So salt, I have no problem with it's It's, you know, it's a good thing to use. Um, just be aware of the drying action and always be aware of um, sand or arena surfaces getting into, into skin, fold, skin folds. Um, any thoughts on horse swimming? So I don't know if you guys have that a lot over there, but here we have a lot of the therapeutic centers that have indoor or outdoor pools that they put horses through and they swim for exercise and therapy. Right. Yeah, absolutely no problem with that. I mean, um, I should imagine they've probably got a bit of chlorine in there, maybe. Um, I think you? something, so. Yeah, probably something like that. I mean, I think with swimming pools things, you can either use saline, ozone, or, or chlorine. Uh, chlorine will be drying, um, but again, it's, you know, antibacterial, so you're fine, really. Same as ozone and salt. Um, and the only other thing I would say is that you would need to just make sure that there's going to be no striking when the horse is swimming. I mean, usually they're pretty good with their legs in there. Um, but if, you know, anything's got a like daisy cutter action or anything, you just need to be careful that you're not going to um, knock um, skin folds. Um, but other than that, swimming would be absolutely fine. I would use the same care as I would do if you were exercising. Swimming is tiring for them. So again, you know, if you've trailered your horse there, um, walk them around, maybe just give them a little bit of a trotter, whatever, warm them up <laughs> and then cool them down. <laughs> let, let them, you know, because bear in mind when they're going in, they're probably a little bit suboptimum and you're asking them to, you know, perform a little bit over what they should be lymphatically. So yeah, not a problem with those. Uh, that is it uh, for the moment. Okay, I think we... Aha, right, ooh, yes, very quick one on this poor wound healing and stuff. And this is just something that, okay, again, this is not my area of expertise, but as, when you work in lymphology, you, 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 to heal wounds is a very difficult thing. So we tend to share a lot of conferences with the tissue viability and wound care nurses, because there's only about 160 of them in the country and there's only about 160 of us. So we tend to cross pollinate quite a lot. So um, the one the thing that you need to be so aware of in lymphatic disease is wounds. You're, you're always going to have delayed wound healing due to um, decreased cellular, cellular immunity and a congested interstitial fluid. Um, usually when you compress correctly, you will heal things because, you know, the underlying um, cellular immunity starts to improve. You can get the new blood and oxygen in and everything starts to get healthier. Things that you can use on poorly healing wounds are things like Supersorb PHMB, which is a hydrogel, which is called um, an intelligent wound dressing. And these are very clever because you put them over the wound and if the wound gets too wet, it takes moisture away. And if the wound gets too dry, it gives moisture to the wound. And this is really important with wound healing in horses. It's also actually important for wound healing in anybody is that your wounds will only heal if they are within the parameters of the sweet spot in between too dry and too wet. And it won't heal if it gets too dry and it won't heal if it gets too wet. Um, and the way to look at it is if you, you've got your wound, you've got your um, granulation tissue around the outside, and just imagine a really fussy man with a backpack standing on the outside, and his job is to walk across the wound bed and knit it together. Now, he will not walk across if the wound is wet. Now, a wet wound, we've all seen them. We've had a, a cut on our hand or whatever we've got in the bath. And then when we come out of the bath, everything looks macerated. And that is the correct term for it. It's wound maceration. It just means the wound bed is too wet and it goes all yellow and manky and pussy looking. And then when it dries out, it starts looking normal again. OK, that's wound maceration. And when your wound looks like that, it will not heal because the fussy little man will not knit the granulation tissue across. Likewise, if your wound is too dry, this is the wound that crusts over and it gets all like 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 sugar crystally kind of thing. A good example of this is a split lip where you smile and it 
cuts back open again or a finger joint and then you move your finger and it splits open it just keeps reopening reopening and usually what happens then is the pathogens get back in and you get secondary infection in there and likewise and exactly the same that fussy little man will not go across the wound when it's too dry so when you look at wounds in your horse for starters put the compression on because you're making the underlying environment healthier secondly analyze that wound you have to make a decision for it as you would every day so if that wound is looking yellow and pussy and manky it's macerated you do not add oils or water to that wound at that time you let it dry out that might mean clipping the hair around it um, stopping putting oil on it whatever whatever just let it dry or get them out of the mud for a bit or use a mud protector wrap or whatever you need to do if it's starting to crust and split open then you need more oils or hydration to the wound and so there's never a set one size fits all for the whole leg <laughs> this is the problem so when you have an entire leg you're looking at the skin overall which might need an emollient or whatever and then you're looking at inside the folds which could be all manky they could be infected in which case you need flamazine they could be you know whatever whatever you need to treat the folds and then let's say your horse has been unlucky and it's been you know cut itself on some wire you have to then look at the wound as well and sometimes you'll need three different things on that leg and you'll have to be changing it accordingly every day but being aware of that just makes things so much easier um you know if it's if it's wet don't wet it further if it's dry wet it now you've got a couple of things you can do and it does help and um you get there faster and it means that your wounds heal faster because you're addressing them correctly um the other thing you can do with a wound that's not healing well at all is you have to be very careful so you can buy ph strips and the ph of the skin is slightly acidic i think it's 5.5 if it starts to get more alkaline, so, you know, six, seven, you need to, when you put the alcohol, if you see that happening with the pH strips, real warning for you, you could have a bio burden on there and you need to address that wound a little bit more strongly, shall we say. Um, it's a good first test on things like that. Um, you sometimes will get other things going on at the same time. So, and lymphedema is quite, naughty for this you, you can sometimes get other stuff coming along at the same time like sarcoids or other neoplastic disease so if you notice that an area looks a bit funny and it really isn't responding don't keep on and on and on you know get your vet you might need to have a look at something else there might be something else going on you might need to take sample for histology um we use quite a lot of silver and alginate dressings um, in lymphedema they're very good they work very well we use super absorbers um, where um, the skin might be getting a little bit too wet or where you might have lymph pouring out of the leg a little bit these um, things like fly we use in the uk but they're really expensive but they are exactly the same as sanitary towels and children's um, diapers don't spend your money on them just go to the shop and get diapers and cut them up um, you can use um, when you get a wound that's really really man manky and needs cleaning you need to be very careful you need to be very clean what you don't want to do on a wound bed is scrub it because you're damaging the granulation tissue in the wound and you're really annoying that little man with the backpack okay you've got to treat him really well i call him a man because he's like really fussy and he can't do his job right <laughs> i shouldn't really say that to anybody listening in the audience but it makes me laugh anyway though it makes you remember it as well um and um there are debridement pads that you can buy now sometimes from pharmacies which are like monofilament pads when you look at them um 
and you under magnification you can see they've almost got little kind of gentle hooks on them and you can just rub those gently over the wound and they will take all the gunk out but they won't destroy the wound bed okay so they're really good and and if there's anything really you that you think oh god if i you know you don't want to scrub stuff because you don't want to every time you debride a wound which basically means you know like clean it you potentially wreck that fragile granulation tissue so you have to be quite careful um one of the other things that you need to be a little bit careful with in lymphedema is manuka honey now manuka is great and i love manuka i use it myself all the time you need medical grade manuka you have to make sure it's got enough of the stuff in it that is going to do the job however when you have a wet wound in lymphedema the macerated ones that i was saying that are going a bit yellow and pussy and manky you don't want to use manuka on that because manuka has an osmotic function so it pulls the water out of the cells and it will make that wound wetter okay so you can use it fairly okay on a dry wound but you shouldn't be using it on a wet wound. And likewise, you have to be quite careful on a dry wound because it can turn it wet quite quickly. So it's one of those things you need to balance and just be aware of. Um, and the other thing, you know, we use a lot of, of daily emollients, especially if you're clipping or shaving the legs, because then you don't have the protective oils from the coat. Um, and so again, as I was saying, Hannah has a very good clipping protocol that needs to be followed. And then you need to be very aware that the skin can get very dry. Dry skin is as much of a risk factor for secondary infection as wet skin. Um, patch test your emollients first. Most of all the ones that we use here in the UK, so um, double base gel, dipra base, um, cetraben, are, uh, have liquid paraffin or paraffin based. So you just need to be a little bit careful with them, but they are very good. What you're looking for in an emollient is it's fast absorbing um and and doesn't just sit on the surface of the skin um firstly if it sits on the surface of the skin it can trap moisture and cause the skin to get slightly wet which we don't want we want it to go into the skin to hydrate it um and the other thing about it is that if you're putting compression on top um, of emollient that's still greasy it can affect the um the fiber G padding of the stable bandage workaround and any other compression garment, the oils can soak into the material and degrade your fabric, which means that you're, you know, um, basically making the shelf life of your garment not last as long, which you don't want to do. So if you do find that you've been left with a bit of an oily residue, then just use a microfiber cloth and try to just get that off very gently um, and, and then you, you're not degrading your compression. Um, and then obviously mud protection is a big issue. Um, it's very hard for horses with very large legs to find mud protection wraps for going out in the mud. Um, this is this is just an issue that, that people have had for, and, and we probably will have for a while. Um, I mean, I will be trying to make some in the future, but right now I, <laughs> I've just got so much to do. Um, but you have to just kind of play that by ear and see what you can find. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, just I'll ask if there's any questions on wound healing first, and then I'll just run through the contraindications. And I think we're pretty much near the end then. I don't have any uh, questions from the group. I do have a question that was sent in by email with photos, but I'll save that until the end um, for the last question. OK, cool. Um, so the other thing to be remind, re, um, mindful of is that um, don't just run off and start to do stuff. Um, <laughs> just be careful here. Um, with regard to um, lymphatic therapy, there are times that you don't do it and there are times where I absolutely never do it. And there are times when you can relatively do it, but you have to be very mindful of what's going on. And the absolute contraindications are thrombosis or blood clots. You do not want to go near this if that happens because you can dislodge a thrombus and cause pulmonary edema and all sorts of awful things. You never want to put anything around a leg ever, 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 ever. If you suspect 
that there might be a possible infection. And the reason for this I touched on before, if you wrap something around a leg and then you go away and the leg blows with an infection, you have a pressure band around that leg that can cause, to cause, cut, cut, um, cause you to cut off circulation. It can be that bad. And so if you're cutting off circulation, if you cut off arterial blood into the leg, you will stop all the oxygen going to the leg and you will get gangrene and the leg will die. Uh, so you don't want to touch it if it's infected. Now, I will, but this is my job. <laughs> but, but if you don't, and that's the whole thing about the garments is they, they're designed, even though the Velcro is very strong, to be able to break open, you know, in an emergency. And that's one of the good things about them that makes me feel a lot happier. I can sleep at night. Um, but um, with a stable bandage workaround, you have to be very mindful of that. And with wound care products as well, sometimes you know you can put them on if you can put them on and just have a little strap at the top or a strap at the bottom that doesn't go the whole way around the leg that's often better than you know wrapping all the way around the leg but is it, it you know you just have to be a bit mindful of that and or if you are going to do it you know make sure that you you know you're not running out and you know being away for the weekend or something you know you need to keep a good eye on these things um we don't ever treat really humans that have got congested heart failure generally speaking horses do not get this but if you are in any doubt about any heart issue you need to talk to your vet and the other thing we tend not to do um, is we don't treat um anybody that has um cancer or neoplastic disease now this is a weird one because it's still being debated hotly debated because the whole idea is, you know, will we dislodge a cancer, uh, you know, cancer, and will that then travel around the body because we've in effect speeded up the lymphatic system? <sighs> you could, but let's say you have cancer and you're a hill runner and you run up a hill. <laughs> well, your heart is going like this, you're pumping blood around like this, the lymphatic system is working doubly hard. So in a way you've speeded it up in a natural way anyway. And so hmm, uh, it, it's one of those things. So we tend not to, although we have, I mean, I have done, um, we do so with oncology permission. And likewise, when a horse, let's say if they're having on, 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 or any kind of treatment, um, you need to be mindful that, let's say, for example, in, in um, treating humans with lymphedema that are going through chemo, for example, a lot of chemo drugs will be flushed through with other um, fluids to stop the um, chemo from affecting the veins and of course that was that will cause swelling but you know you've got to let that happen because you want to you know you don't want to affect the you know the the detrimental effect on the vein from the, the actual chemotherapy so we have to really defer to oncologists for that this is other level stuff but you just need to be a bit mindful relative contraindications are um, hyperthyroidism because of potential discharge from thyroid hormones you can still treat people or horses but it tends not to happen too much in horses um hypertension uh, again doesn't really happen in horses Bronchial asthma or COPD does, and we can treat bronchial asthma in humans, but we tend not to do it while they're in an attack phase. So if your horse does have COPD, um, it's not contraindicated to put compression on, but you might need to be mindful in case it's, you know, in an attack phase, you probably want to take the compression off. We don't treat anything and we recommend that you don't put any compression on in the first trimester of pregnancy. This is not because it can cause any trouble. It's just because let's say that somebody or a mare was going to abort on a Wednesday because of whatever natural reasons and you put compression on a Tuesday or you treated them on a Tuesday, they could blame you for they could, you know, every, sometimes people just want to blame people, right? So you have to just be a bit careful. We do that just for insurance purposes as well, really. And chronic inflammation, um, we, again, just we're quite careful and cautious with it. Um, it depends where and how much and whether it's affecting them and things. And um, vaccination or injection, especially subcutaneous ones, because if we were clearing the area using manual lymph drainage, 
um, it might affect um, absorption in the area. So these are things just to be careful of. Um, and then literally these are things that we see. This is scarring from lymphedema, from lymphangitis, previous infections you see on the left where the skin's blown open before, that's pretty substantial um, scarring. And on the right, you see um, lymphorrhea. So this is lymph pouring out of the leg um, and, um, and yeah, pretty nasty. Um, this is the horse with multi-layer lymphedema bandaging on. And then on the um, right is before we really invented all the compression boots, but you know, we got the horse, lovely, lovely, lovely mare. Um, got down to, um, I think it was 150% and maintained at around about 35, um, which was really lovely. Um, we don't just treat horses. <laughs> we get asked to do odd things. Um, so this is a lovely Irish wolfhound called Lupo, who um, whose owner had gone everywhere. And you can see the leg. I mean, he was literally um, losing about a pint of lymph a day we were really, really dangerous. So we bandaged him up and then I was really concerned about what compression garment we'd be able to use. But fortunately he was such an enormous dog that we, his, his feet were the same size of my hand and his legs were the same size of my arm. So um, I got him made a, a, an adapted human arm sleeve and um, he went for the rest of his life very happy in his little thing. And then he, he wore his, um, his compression garment during the day. And then when he went out for a walk, he just had one of those little waterproof boots over the top. And um, he had a lovely dog. So in fact, actually funny enough, one of the things that we're doing and looking into now is not just for dogs and cats, but um, we know that there's a lot of um, legal cases against vets now that have bandaged incorrectly and have caused um, small animals to have to have limbs amputated because of using too much pressure. So we could technically make safe wound care products for these based on the kind of class one and class two boots with attention markers so that you could use them for dogs and cats that have had operations and stuff. But, you know, that's something we can look at in the future. Um, these are examples of, um, again, um, mare with, with secondary lymphedema, the multi-layer lymphedema bandaging in the middle, and the, the, we, I treated her all the way through her pregnancy and through um, through her having her foal. And these are the examples on the on the right of all of the um, data that I would be taking from the leg as I was reducing it. Um, and I not only che check the pathological to the non pathological leg, but I also check each section against other sections. So I'll check how one pastern is doing against the other, one fetlock is doing against the other. And sometimes you can then see or hazard a guess because you think, okay, well, if the cannon bone went down 20% and the pastern went down 20%, but the fetlock's only gone down 10, then you can start to think, well, maybe there's scar tissue in that area. Um, maybe there's been an old infection there. And then you can tailor extra treatment, you know, using things like the Hivermap machine, the deep oscillation machine, which I use a lot of into that area to soften it and then bandage again and see whether it comes up so you know, it does get a bit technical with the spreadsheets um, and so yeah that's where we are just to mention then about the hiver map machine the deep oscillation is pretty much the only machine that we use in lymphedema it's actually um, a german machine that's made by physio med it's imported into the UK by a company called PhysioPod UK. Mm -hmm. And this is actually uses um, electrostatic, so it doesn't create any heat and it's incredibly gentle. Um, but what it's very good for is softening um, protein fibrosis and softening scar tissue. Um, so um, it literally pulls or attracts very, very gently the water in the cells one way and the other. So you have this lifting and oscillating effect. So where things are stuck together, it starts to do this and loosen it. Once it's loosened, it stays loosened, which is fantastic. And then you know, it's much easier um, to get lymph through um, these harder or indurated areas. And certainly you probably won't find a lymph drainage therapist without one of these now, um, except in horses, I never really bother with the massage. 
um, part of it because, you know, I could spend three hours doing it and then your horse is going to spend six hours in a stable. You know, you're going to nullify the results of it. I just think it's a waste of time and money, really. You might as well just put them in safe compression and, you know, and, and shove the hive map machine on any sort of very hard nodule and give that a really good blast. Uh, they're not cheap machines, I hate to say. Um, yeah. I probably wouldn't use them in early stage CPL, but we certainly use them in later stages. But what I do now is because I think, well, one treatment isn't really going to be enough. You know, it's when you start off treating very indurated and congested tissue, it's what we call an inertial mass. It takes a lot of power to start getting it going first, like pushing a parked car. You know, you need three people to get it going. But once it's going, it's easy to go. And it's exactly the same thing. You do the first treatment, you think, yep, that's worked. But then it really then starts to. So we started to look at um, renting those out here. So hopefully that will be OK. And then owners can actually rent them and, you know, put two weeks of, of treatment into their horses nodules and and things to soften them out and um so hopefully that will that will work but they're um they're useful to read up about if you go on the physiopod uk mm -hmm. website there's a lot of information about it on there and that's pretty much the only machine that's really available that does a lot um and but sadly they are Expensive. They're pretty expensive. I think I can't yeah. remember what the price is, but yeah, I have looked at those also. They are about two thousand seven hundred pounds right now, which is probably what three three thousand three thousand. Probably yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, there we are at the end. <laughs> Again, I have, a, yeah. <laughs> I have a question from Karen, and she wants to know: Is chronic proliferative pastern dermatitis cppd considered a neoplastic disease i'm not sure <laughs> that's honest. a tricky that's a tricky issue yeah i tend to always think of them as, as kind of like warts in a way but i don't actually know that much about them i see them um coming in to horses with with cpl and lymphedema and um i I tend to, I've seen people, I've seen people with horses that have had them removed. They tend to come back. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're, they're very, very highly vascularized. So, um, and sometimes they'd be sitting very close to arteries and stuff. So they've used all sorts of things like cryotherapies of freezing them off and other surgical techniques to take them off. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a hard one. I would tend to say probably try if you, wanted to but you need to have all of your protocol in in action you need to be able to support that leg lymphatically because you know you're causing big trauma to the leg and you need to be able to support that i don't know to what degree they are linked with lymphedema but you certainly have to support the lymphedema um, and i we can't you can work around them and compression tends not to be too bad. However, I mean, actually Hannah and I went out to see a horse recently that had a really big one on the side. And we were really concerned because, you know, we were worried that that would be pressing against the, um, you know, bone and causing trouble, um, pressure against, the, um, you know, sort of like sideburn. And, um, and actually that horse did tolerate that quite well. And what we do in situations like that especially also where you might have arthritis and you're worried about compression is I do the, the um, what I call the arthritis or the nodule protocol where we don't know that when we're going to press those nodules, whether it's going to affect the horse and, and cause discomfort, which we don't want. Um, we have to be aware, whether we have to ascertain whether the horse is going to be comfortable in compression. Um, and especially so with arthritis, where you've got bone on bone and then you're pressing with compression. Well, that that bone is going to press even more against each other and be very uncomfortable. So what we do with those is we use stable bandage workaround, but we do one leg at a time and we do a slow build up to test tolerance levels. So with this horse, we put it on for two hours during the day and watched it if that was okay 
We did four hours the next day and watched, and then six, and then eight, and then 10. Once they're tolerating the 10, you know that they can be stabled overnight on that leg with no ill effect. And then when you've ascertained on that leg, you do the next one and the next one and the next one. And luckily this, this horse looked pretty bad. I mean, I must say, you know, we were a bit like, oh, oof. And he's managed to be okay with them. We adapted stable bandage workaround. We we cut the fiber G pads with a little hole in, like you would a human corn pad, so that the nodule sat in between and it was well protected. And I'm glad we did it because that little guy is is managing. And now if the owners wanted to, they could put them in compression boots because you know we know that. The horse would be able to tolerate them whereas at the beginning you know i wouldn't recommend buying the equilymph boots at all because i wouldn't i would want to know that that horse would be able to tolerate it and any of these nodules um or the cc ppd nodules wouldn't be pressing in on the leg so you have to be careful yeah, and quite mindful on those uh that's the last question i have so if it's okay with you i will pull up the pictures of leslie's horse and ask those questions and then i also have the uh links to your site the cpl facebook group and such that i'd like to show the group and then we can come back for closing comments and any final questions so if you're still listening and you have questions be thinking of them put them in the q a box um and we'll get to those in a second. So I am going to flip over to my screen. So you guys should be able to see my screen now. Can you see it? Can you see my screen, Rebecca? I can see your screen saver. Yeah, yeah. So this is... Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. So Leslie sent these pictures in today, which I thought was kind of nice. Oh, so I'm just going to read her um, her email that she sent in. She says she has a 14 year old Frisian mare that she has imported from the Netherlands, and the mare has been diagnosed with CPL. She's yeah. taken several pictures of her lower legs and hocks over the past few weeks since the last webinar. And she's implemented daily cleaning dry, the, and drying well, shaving the feathers, applying compression nightly when stalled. The horse is given ample free turnout and massaging affected areas gently with soft brush and a lower leg pulse massage. She's watching for any open sores and, and the horse has regular farrier care. So her questions are, is there anything else that she should be doing or is there something that she should not be doing? That's the first question. Right, the soft brushing for starters, I wouldn't do. Um, one way to always check whether your soft brush is okay is to actually just run it gently on your inside of your arm. If it goes pink, don't use it, it's too much. Um, you don't wanna be scratching and scraping that at all. The CPL there, the nodules, especially in the middle photo, and you can see the, the little round nodules, it looks very much like um, previous mite damage. Right. Um, and so you've got the combination of the CPL folds, which are not that bad, actually, to be fair, and the mite damage. So don't panic about mite damage like that. It looks unsightly, but it is nowhere near going to be messing up your, uh, can be affecting the superficial drainage, but your deep drainage is still working. Um, but using CPL as uh, so the stable bandage workaround to help support these legs in, the, in any time that this mare is stabled will be very beneficial to you. Um, I would um, pick one big nodule on each leg measure it photograph it and press into it and you know from one to five with one being soft like your thumb here and five being hard like a table and then seeing how that monitors um the stretch test on this would probably not be too bad um but it's useful to go to a healthy horse in this another healthy horse in the same yard or stable and just test their legs and see how they feel against these um the skin to me looks a little dry uh, could just be the day or the photo, but um, I can't. I can't tell. Um, I would say it's right after she clipped it. So right, as yeah, you mentioned, yeah, yeah. it's, it's probably it's a moment on after. Yeah, after but um, uh, so and then what? What were you saying about there was a there was a 
thing after the brushing there was a yes she says she's doing lower leg massage so there's a few things we probably yeah, have do that. <laughs> yeah. tonight not yes. to be doing <laughs> yeah yeah don't do that <laughs> um you don't need to um you know um just don't the compression will do what you want it to do now and, and let let that work i mean one thing that you can do um and we're, we're going to try and make them but and so we've been so busy with the double ups we haven't got around to it but what you if you're crafty if you know you know if you can use things is with um with nodules is if you've got two layers of very very thin cotton fabric and then if you get some hard bits of foam not really hard but just you know quite quite firm and then just but and there'll be about you know sort of that size sort of between my fingers sort of like half a centimeter or whatever and then put some glue on the inside of the fabric and then just drop the hard foam bits on there just randomly and then just sandwich the other bit of fabric on top what happens then is you've got a, a fabric pad with little sort of bulgy bits in you can put those against the you can cut them to shape and put them up against the nodules and then put stable bandage work around on top and what happens is the little nodules then just gently massage into the skin that would be far more effective for you to soften that leg down than than massaging and don't brush it i mean you know like you can use a very very soft brush but you know just again test it on your arm first if you do you know and it, you can see that it's getting um pink it's too much um but, but you know um that will save you time as well <laughs> so you don't have to do that but yeah they 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 don't look too bad um and and you should be able to improve quite well from here if you if you support in compression she asks how low on the legs should they place the compression wraps and I don't um, know, I don't quite know what she means. I don't know if she's oh, okay. stable this, workaround bandage or something else. Yeah, okay. If it, if I'm, I'm talking about stable workaround bandage and that's what you should be doing here if you can. Um, if you're joining the group, you can, if- um, Yeah, I'll show. And if you check and see whether she's on the group and, and whether we can mm -hmm. see pictures of that, because that would be the, the best way yeah um to, to look to look after it and and if you're feeling you know particularly crafty and you want and you want to make those little kind of we call them lymph pads then that that's also quite a useful thing for all cpl horses to be honest the only thing you have to watch out is it doesn't slip around you know so just keep relatively small bits um but yeah that that leg should improve and should stay like that and um good for you for for looking at that and i know it's always very sad when you shave off the lovely feathers but you've done the right thing Definitely. she also asks how much exercise is appropriate giving the degree of cpl on this horse exercise as much as you like <laughs> just long warm up and long cool down the more they move the better okay um we i have another question coming through from the q a box and they would like to know how much the equilibrium boots are <laughs> <laughs> uh, well the class one and two boots the fitted ones are 95 pounds for one and i think 160 for a pair they will not fit onto non-feathered horses the double wraps right now are early access um so they are, if you send me an email on info at equilymph.co.uk, I can send you all the details of early access. We can only do right now, there'll be a registration form and then you have to send in some photos to me so I can have a look at the leg. Because we can only, if it's CPL stage A or early B, I can help you shim those and fit those over a video consult. Um, which is much easier. If you have more advanced CPL, we cannot send them out right now to overseas because you know you need to be you need to have them fitted well. You know, and these are things that you know we 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 haven't like got the products for CPL C and D yet. Um, the double wraps are sadly not cheap because they're hard to make. Um, so right now they're two hundred and twenty pounds for one and 420 for a pair um and they come with all of the shims and everything else as well 
Um, but if you drop me a, an email and some photos, I can advise you and tell you what you need. Um, and I can talk further to anyone that, that has any questions about them. The chances are that the price will go up um, because um, they just are an absolute swine to make. Um, so if you've got a stable bandage workaround, good. <laughs> um, and, and likewise, the Fibre G pads, I mean, I've usually always got um, about 20 sets of pads here. Um, and I'm happy to, I mean, if somebody's, I'm happy to just post them straight out to people, to be honest, um, uh, because I post them out anyway around the UK quite often. Um, but um, yeah, so that's a possibility. And they're very light, but then probably one of the best things for me to do is just send over a ton of them to um, to somebody who acts as a bit of a distributor. And that might be that we talk to the people that make them and see whether they can actually find a way to get them over. But um, again, if anybody's interested, let me know and I'll put the time in to try and do that. Um, but right now I'm, you know, fairly busy lady. <laughs> So um, with that, I uh, want to show you guys a few important links that will, you know, keep your education going and allow you to start the process of figuring out where you go from here. So if you wanted to um, look at Rebecca's website, this is the Equilimp website. So on here, I believe um, contact, I think you can contact um them through their your, your website correct is yeah that... we've only got the knowledge base and yeah. various bits up there but more so this is, is be loaded. excellent and there's a lot of information on her website and more is coming um she's building it so check that out for sure and then um getting back to my important links um this is a website that um Hannah and you and others, I think, worked on. And there's a ton of information on here. So if you're not a social media person or you just want to go straight to the information and you want to avoid the Facebook group, you can get a lot of information on here. There's a ton of pictures. I just I can't recommend this enough there. You could just sit on here and read through everything and find out a lot of important information. There's everything from the diagnosis and much of the things that we talked about in the last um, two webinars, ways to treat, track living. If you want to look at setting up a track or a paddock paradise, there's information there. There's just just ton of information. So and then buying a feathered horse, all kinds of information. So highly recommend. You check that out. And then um, the last thing to show you is the actual Facebook group. Um, this is how I found all this information quite a while ago. So I recommend if you use social media, if you're a Facebook person, you will learn so much by just watching the uh, questions that people ask on here. And Hannah, we've been talking about her the last two webinars, but she she runs this and um, with the help of several other people. But again, tons of pictures, information, questions. The only thing I would ask, you know, just to keep Hannah sane, use the <laughs> use the guide. So she has yeah. done so Here much work to organize the information on this page. So before you go out and ask a bunch of questions like, should I shave my horse's feathers? That, that question's already been asked. So use the search box and you know type in there and see if someone has already answered asked and answered yeah. that question as well yeah. and there are some great um there's some great experts in there as well so you should, hannah's really got a, a good bunch of people there so um tag people i mean i'm i know sometimes i'm out for a long while but you know if you tag us we'll find you and we'll always try and answer the question or well, hannah tags me and i promise i always try and get back to you as quickly as i can <laughs> i guess i don't see any more questions uh debbie says she hopes hannah's feeling better i think she i think she is i saw her on there today so with that rebecca is there anything you want to say before we close um, no, apart from thank you for being a great audience and I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a lot and um, or at least got things to think about. Um, do you feel free to email me if you suddenly think, oh God, I needed to ask her a question or whatever. I mean, chances are it's probably on the CPL Facebook page. So as I said, as, you know, just search on there. But 
if you get stuck, then, you know, you know where I am and, um, you know, the email. And I keep checking back to the Equilimp site because there's more and more going on now soon. And the members pages will be up where you can enter your horses measurements and help with data um coming through in the future um so yeah no really happy very honored to be here and um very happy to talk about equine lymphatics um forever <laughs> basically <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so hopefully it's giving you some tips and some ideas and and also hopefully um you know a lot of hope as well this isn't a even though it's chronic progressive disease, you know, all is not lost. You know, you can you can win here, you know, so go out Absolutely. and win. Well, um, again, we want to thank you so much, Rebecca. I think, as I said last time, it, the, the amount of information and the depth of your knowledge just really, it blew us away. So <laughs> this turned out to be more informative than I could have ever imagined. So we're so grateful that uh, the members of FAUNA will have a, place to go to learn about CPL by watching these webinars. I, I, there's been a ton of views on the first one already. So people are getting this information and it's something that will be there. They can access now and into the future. So um, on behalf of the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses, our sponsor tonight, we would like to thank you and the audience also for attending the webinar. If you think of any additional questions, um, do exactly what Leslie did. Um, submit them to fauna at fauna.com and we will direct them to Rebecca or the right resource for a response. So if something comes up or you have photos and you, you want a, a second opinion, you can also use the CPL Facebook group. But if you want to speak directly to Rebecca, we're happy to link you up with her. Um, this webinar was recorded, as I mentioned, and it should be added to our library soon. To find the webinars, just go to fauna.com and right on the landing page, you, you will see webinars, the icon for that. So again, thank you to everyone. Oh. Oh, this happened last time. A few more questions. Um, it was just a thank you to everyone. Oh. So um, I guess that's it. So we will see you guys out on the CPL Facebook group in other ways as well. And thank you so much, Rebecca. Have a good night. I know it's a late one for you, but we still appreciate your time. It goes on to about one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh God. Anyway, but lovely to lovely to um, met you all virtually and um, have a great uh, day and into your week. And it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. No we'll problem. Take care. Bye. Bye.